with uh, with a GBI or you all I know have used in the past a different examiner just in, in the off chance that somebody's not available and they should probably start working on that today. We can switch her and Miss Lowry's testimony if we need to. All right. Well, like I said, let's just see where we are. That way. Okay. That. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Anybody else? Okay. All right, lawyers. Uh, that is defense lawyers. One, one other quick, quick matter here. I've talked with the state this morning. Um, the state has not yet responded to my omnibus motions. Our omnibus motions. The state says that that they need a little bit more time. And that's that's fine. That's good. That's no problem. And I'll be happy to talk about that. Okay. Proceeding forward with the number two. I haven't received anything <clears throat> other than CVs for the um, for the expert witnesses if there are any if there is any research if there is any articles if there are anything in particular under the um, here's what uh, I've used to form my expert opinions if there's anything any of these witnesses are going to rely on that's going to be introduced by the state such wow. as professional Pleasure. articles or otherwise they should have turned those over to you already. okay that's um, that's what i was just making sure that there's nothing but cvs at least for now um, right okay all right mr williams joins in that request as well. all right anybody any other defense defense lawyers that we have here let me just go ahead and find out oh, let's see um so see, let's take let's take roll to see who's here today too so i can go ahead and uh all right mr adams Yes, sir. No, it's, I'm sorry, defendant, no, Khalif Adams. Good morning, Judge. Good morning, madam. Tiamre Cowan on behalf of Mr. Khalif Adams. All right, Mr. Adams is next to you. Good morning, madam. Okay, then we have uh, Ronte Beebe. Good morning, Your Honor. Durante Parsons on behalf of Mr. Beebe. Good morning, sir, and good morning, Mr. Beebe. All right, uh, well, let me, while I'm doing this, uh, Mr. Partridge, do you have any other uh, objections or uh, issues that you wish to bring up in regards to Daubert or 702? Uh, nothing at this time, Your Honor. Okay, all right. Um, DeMonte Blaylock. DeMonte Blaylock? Yeah, DeMonte Blaylock. Oh, you're right. All right, good morning, sir. And Mr. Blaylock is next to you. Good morning, sir. Are any issues as to Daubert or 702 that otherwise have not been raised already? Nothing at the moment. Okay, thank you, sir. All right. Um, Good morning, Mr. Adams, and good morning, uh, good morning, Mr. Williams. Morning, okay, all right. Heard from you all. All right, let's see. Cordarius Dorsey. Good morning, y'all. Sweetie child, on behalf of Mr. Dorsey. Uh, he is still okay, in the process G. of getting here. Okay. So my only request, many of these expert witnesses do not apply to us. Uh, I think the gang ones are the most important one to us. So... I just be asking that we hold off on those until he's physically here, so we can, you know, engage in the uh, in the actual motion yard. If uh, if if necessary, would you be uh, okay with us trying to lo uh, to involve him via Zoom? I have absolutely no objection to that. If he can at least be present uh, virtually. We can right. go forward on that yard. We'll try and work on that. See if we can't get that done uh, in the in the absence. Yes, sir. I would. Yeah. Yeah, see if you can do it at our break, Mr. Chamberlain. If we can do that, that would be great. Thank okay. you. All right, thank you, sir. Any other issues as to Daubert uh, and 702 other than what you've mentioned already? No, I think the uh, the gang experts are the ones that are going to be um, hashed out. Anything else, all the medicals most likely will be able to stipulate after okay. we have a discussion with the state. Wonderful. Okay, thank, thank you. you, sir. All right. Um, okay, Mr. Eppinger. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, sir. All right, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Eppinger. All right, okay, Mr. Johnson, anything other, uh, that you'd like to raise that otherwise hasn't been presented already? I'm not doing it today. It'll probably be tomorrow. It, it, or actually, I may do it. It depends on, it depends on whether or not how much, how much time I have left and, and uh, availability, okay? So I'll note your objection 
in that respect, okay? Okay, all right. Uh, all right, um, let's see. Miles Farley. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Reneas. I got your 25 motions, all right? So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll knock those out at some point in time, okay? All right, thank you, sir. Okay, um, Javon Fleetwood. Mr. Fleetwood, good morning, sir. All right, Mr. Hoover, do we have him a lawyer or is it still Ms., um, Ms. Hemingway? We are still in the process of trying to get Mr. Fleetwood. Okay, all right, Mr. Fleetwood, uh, you're uh, welcome to sit back there. This pertains to you, uh, and we'll, we're trying to still get you a lawyer, so bear with us, okay? Yes, sir? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, um, let's see. Damekin Garlington. Mr. Garlington? Oh, sir, I think you're still in the process. We still need to get you an attorney, correct? Yes? yes sir. Okay. Yes, Mr. Hoover? I was just going to stand and say yes if I needed to. Okay, all right. All right, Quintavious Greer. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Ms. Mormon. Mike Rush on behalf of Mr. Greer as well. Okay, all right. Um, any other issues in regards to the Daubert or 702 issues? No, Your Honor. All right, okay. Okay, Marquivis Huey, Mr. Huey. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Matthews. All right, any other issues in regards to Daubert or 702, sir, that otherwise have not been raised? No, Your Honor. However, uh, for the peanut gallery back here, Judge, when the lawyers are addressing the court, if we could just speak into the microphone so we can hear back here. Yes, sir. Okay, fair enough. All right, um, DeMonte Kendrick. Good morning, Your Honor. Doug Weinstein here for Mr. Kendrick. Good morning again, sir. All right. Any other issues in regards to Daubert or 702 that otherwise have not been raised? No, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Demise McMullen. Okay. He's in the corner. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, do we have an attorney for him or is that still Amanda Young? We're still working on that one as well, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Okay, uh, Tenquarius Mender. Yeah. Where are you, sir? Yeah, sir. Put your hand up, raise your hand right quick. No, I'm back, oh, okay, I see him. Okay, all right. Where is Ms. Fagan? Is Ms. Fagan still your attorney? Yes, sir. I think Ms. Fagan was on trial last week. I don't know if that trial is still continuing. Yeah, yeah where can we check on her, please? All right, thank you, sir. All right, Jaden Myrick. Good morning, Judge. Good morning, Ms. Bernard. I would join in on Mr. Hobby's um, request and Adam's request that we be subject to objection. Okay, all right. Thank you, madam. All right, um, Cormarvius Quim Nichols, Mr. Harvey, again, good morning. Anything else, sir? No, Judge. Um, thank you. But can I ask you a question? May I? Ask? You, you, well, yes, you can ask me a question. Okay. Okay. I may not have an answer for you, but uh, well, but it, uh, I'll try. It's kind of up to you. Okay. Um, do you think it would be easier if we had an automatic opt-in rule, um, and that anybody that wants to opt out can say, "Hey, I'm out of that one," instead of going. You know, um, I'm doing this because I need to take role. No, no, I, okay, I, so, I get that. I'm just asking as far as you're concerned and everybody else is concerned, we can automatically opt in if the court makes that ruling in that way. Um, anybody that doesn't say I'm out is automatically joined and we don't have to. I don't uh, have any issue with that. Okay, no, good. So. Can we do any of you guys have any objections? To that? I'll opt into that. What? I'll opt into that. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, if, with your permission. I sure. think that would make things a, a lot easier. Okay. I don't have any issue with that. Okay. All right. Okay, uh, Rodeus Ryan. Attorney Angela Galeos for Mr. Ryan. Good morning again, uh, madam. Uh, is Mr. Ryan sitting next to you? Yes, he is. He's okay, all right, thank you. Any other issues in regards to Daubert or 702, madam? No, no, Okay, all right. Uh, I just heard from Ms. Fagan. Uh, she is in with it on this, a speedy trial motion. I think she needs to say she bought a conflict. Her, her trial last week, she received an acquittal, uh, but she is in Gwinnett, and uh, I can communicate with her if you want her to get here after the hearing. I filed this, and this was filed on the 22nd of November, so she needs to have done it. We, I don't know if we got a conflict letter. Did we get one, Mr. Chamberlain? I have to check my email. All right. I better not pay this way after she's done her hearing. All right. Thank you, sir. All right, Antonio Sledge. Yes. Where are you, Mr. Sledge? I okay, all right. Do we have uh, an attorney yet, Mr. Hoover? No, Your Honor, still working on that. Yeah, Mr. Wright is withdrawn, is that right? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Okay, all right. Trontavia Stevens, Ms. Gladden. Yes, uh, Your Honor, I don't have any information for any other petition. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, madam. All right, uh, Shannon Stillwell. David Potts from Mr. Stillwell. He says, all the time you need. Okay, okay, all right. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay, I'm Antonio Sumlin. Good morning, Your Honor. Sean Hoover. Mr. Sumlin is here, and we just updated what everybody else said. Okay, all right. Thank you, sir. All right. Okay, I've taken roll, and I think we've accounted for everybody we need to account for, as well as councils. Um, okay. Ms. Rosenwasser, I will, uh, it, the time is about 10.50. Uh, let me go ahead and give you till about, the uh, till about 11.20, and I can check in with you at that point in time. I'll come back out. And you can, uh, you as well as other council can go ahead and tell me what 
uh, what arrangements or agreements you have come uh, come to uh, in regards to the uh, experts and uh, and the days. Uh, what I'm hoping, or if you are, then we can maybe reorder some of these witnesses, like especially your gang expert, since they may take a little bit of time. Um, and I have a question. Why is Mr. Viverito testifying via video conference? Your Honor, that was, uh, I spoke to the court about that um, at the hearing on November 17th. I asked the court if there was if there was a witness who had pre-planned travel plans, if we could do her via video conference. Okay, yes, you did. We filed that motion. Only defendant Kitchens objected, and he is no longer on this case. That's, yeah, okay, I got it. I, I remember that, madam. Okay, all right. Thank you, Okay, um... Let me go ahead and recess then so you all can chat. And uh, I'll, like I said, I'll come back on uh, at 20, 20, there, 20 minutes after or thereabouts and we can go ahead and continue our discussions, okay? So we're in recess. Thank you. All right. Councils, if we go ahead and uh, get situated again, thank you very much. All right, Ms. Rosenwasser, um, did you have ample time to talk with your colleagues? Uh, yes, Your Honor, I believe that we have uh, spoken, and from what I understand, I hope Defense Counsel will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, our general the conclusion that I was able to understand is that they would like us to put all of our witnesses up and certainly establish the qualifications and the reliability, um, but they are particularly interested in challenging our gang experts. So I think that, but we will, so that, that said, we will be prepared to go ahead and present testimony from all the witnesses on our list. If that's fair. That, that, that's fair. And, and logistically what that means, Judge, is that uh, we're not waiving um, the qualifications that will be required under, under Daubert, um, but we do not anticipate that we will have much, if any, questions for certain uh, witnesses. For example, as we discussed before, medical examiners, uh, forensic chemists, uh, fingerprint experts, that sort of thing. Uh, we will certainly have, uh, we, extend, we expect to have a significant amount of um, questioning for the gang experts once they're put off. Okay. Well, I'm just trying to, uh, to, to get as much opportunity to do that so to that extent we'll we'll, we'll uh if we may have if we reach we may have to reshuffle some of these witnesses but uh let's just see let's just see where we are um all right can we uh for the witnesses you have today uh you have dr sullivan yes mr lazen yes and you have miss sims do you have any of those available right now i have your honor we have uh, Dr. Sullivan and Mr. Laws on available, and as I as I said earlier, Ms. Sims had that family emergency, so Dr. Sims will be on the 29th. But we do have Deputy Hall available to come today if the court would like to fill out the schedule today. He's available. We had him on the schedule for tomorrow, but we can get him here this afternoon if the court would like to hear from him as well. Uh, I'm trying to accommodate some other folks that are not here as of yet, since that's fairly substantial and significant testimony. So, um, and I'm trying to make sure I can deconflict whether or not, you know, everyone was given an opportunity to be here today. Everyone was noticed to be here today. So, um, so we 
can certainly have uh, Deputy Hall call, come tomorrow as planned. I just wanted to make sure we had him available for the court because we were sorry about that last minute family emergency with uh, Dr. Sims. But well, is there any way that we can get like uh, Miss Scott or Mr. Panea or um, the or Mr. Brennan or, or Paul Zick, Dr. Hanninger, any of um, those folks or any earlier than I can because I don't think it's going to take us that long to finish. I mean, I was, for, for the uh, I was just going to use Dr. Sullivan and Mr. Lant kind of as a test matter and we'll see how long it takes. But um, your honor, I can so um, I can certainly call uh, if, if the court is um, um, Miss Scott is the is the witness whose child is sick, so we had moved her to Wednesday. But I, if the court would be amenable to her via video conference, I might be able to get her this afternoon. Um, I can certainly try to make some calls and see if I can get anyone else. But let's yeah. let's just let's just see how long. Let, let's just get Dr. Sullivan here uh, and get her get her. Uh... And we all yes, and we also do have um, Officer Lazone. They're both back here and ready to go. Let's just do those and see how long that takes us and then we can kind of gauge from there. But and I can kind of at lunch uh, give you some marching orders of maybe some other people we can get maybe this afternoon or th or via Zoom. OK. OK. Thank you. All right. OK. All right. So go ahead and summon Dr. Sullivan, please. Karen Sullivan, K A R E N S U L L I V A N. Hey, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, thank you for being here today. Um, could you, and I know you just spelled your name for the record. Can you please state where you currently are, are employed? I'm the chief medical examiner for the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office here in Atlanta. And how long have you been employed there? Um, I did my fellowship year of forensic pathology training in 2002 to 2003, stayed on part time until October 2007, at which point I became a full time employee there. Okay. And what was your um, education prior to becoming a medical examiner, the chief medical examiner? Well, I have an undergraduate degree in zoology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a master's degree in anatomy from the University of Georgia. And after which I was a high school teacher here in Fulton County for about five and a half years before going to medical school at Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta. And then I did a pathology residency um, at Emory University and then a forensic pathology fellowship at the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office in conjunction with Emory. Okay, thank you very much. And so through all those positions with that, was that all training to become a uh, medical examiner, especially the medical school and the other courses you took? Yes. Okay. Um, is that the general path of training for people that, are, that would become a medical examiner or chief medical examiner? Yes. Um, are you involved in any professional organizations? The National Association of Medical Examiners. Okay, thank you. Um, Your Honor, at this, at this point, I would like to move to admit States Exhibit 1 for the purposes of this hearing. It is Dr. Sullivan's CV. This has been provided to all defense, but I'm happy to show anyone if they have any other questions. Any objection by any defense counsel as to States 1? Dr. Sullivan's uh, curriculum VT, CV. On behalf of Mr. Williams, there's no objection. All right, anybody else? Objection. No objection, Your Honor. Is there anybody have an objection? Okay, if you don't have an objection, then I'll, I'll admit uh, uh, stage one for purposes of this hearing, okay? Thank you, and uh, may I bring it up to? Yes, you can hand it to um, Ms. Weaver, please. <clears throat> and Dr. Sullivan, did you have to get any specific certifications or anything to do your job? Yes, I'm board certified in anatomic and clinical pathology, and I'm also board certified in forensic pathology. Okay. 
Now, do you have to ever take any kind of continuing education classes or continuing trainings? Continuing education, yes. How often do you have to do that? Um, every other year when I renew my license, my medical license. Is that basically up to date on, you know, new procedures or any other things that might keep you up to date on anything that would have come out in the field? Yes. Okay. Um, have you ever taught any Can classes? Oh, I'm sorry. Can everyone hear me better now? Yes. I'm sorry. Dr. Sullivan, have you ever taught any classes or seminars or other trainings? I teach um, classes at Morehouse School of Medicine in the second year pathology course. And what are the subject of those classes? Well, one is um, injuries, which is a basic introduction to forensic pathology. I also teach lectures in um, cardiovascular diseases, urinary tract diseases, um, hemato hematopoietic diseases, and central nervous system tumors. And um, have you ever had anything that you've done published or appeared in any publications or other media forms? No. Okay. Um, how many autopsies have you done ballpark? Um, I've either done myself or supervised a resident or fellow approximately 3,000 autopsies. And do you currently perform autopsies in your job now as the chief medical examiner? Yes. Okay. And as the chief medical examiner, does that mean you are the, are you the highest ranking member in your office? Yes. Okay. So do you supervise others doing that as well? Yes. Have you been qualified as an expert witness before? I have. Um, do you know about how many times? I, I think it's over 100, but I don't know an exact number. Has that always been in Fulton County Superior Court or other courts as well? There was one other court, Gwinnett County, in a civil case. Okay. And what was the subject of the testimony in the Fulton County court cases? Um, homicide cases, I think, have been the vast majority. Um, there may have been a traffic accident case, but I believe the majority of them were homicides. And is part of your job determining like how someone died or the cause of their death? Yes. Okay. Um, what techniques do you use to conduct autopsies or determine cause of death? Are there certain methods that you've learned? Well, we examine the person externally for natural disease and trauma and internal examination of the organs also for natural disease and trauma and also interpret toxicology results, vitreous chemistry results in order to determine cause and manner of death. Okay. And have you been trained in analyzing all those different factors that you just discussed? Yes. And is that something you learned in medical school or through textbooks, publications? Um, medical school, residency, and fellowship. Okay. And it, are those different um, analyses and t procedures that you perform, are those written up in medical textbooks or other written publications? They are. Okay. Is that fairly a standard procedure that most medical examiners use? It is, yes. So is there sort of a certain standard way to conduct an autopsy and determine um, manner of death? Yes. Okay. And does that, is the work that you do in the autopsies ever checked or examined by colleagues or other reviewing boards? Yes. Who reviews it? In our office, all homicide cases and undetermined manner of death cases are peer reviewed by another person in the office. Are there generally standards controlling the work that you do in performing the autopsies? I'm not, under, I'm not sure what you mean by standards. I guess a better way to ask would be are there best practices to perform an autopsy? Yes. And are those the, the practices that we discussed earlier that are published and taught in medical schools and in your training? Yes. And when you do autopsies, do you follow those best practices? Yes. Do you do that every time you perform an autopsy or supervise an autopsy? I do. And who else uses this same autopsy procedure and investigation procedure that you discuss? Is that every school or um, pathologist's office? Is it just to Georgia? Is it just to y'all? No, it, it's um, all medical examiner offices who are members of the National Association of Medical Examiners or NAME follow their standards. So the majority, I would say, of, of offices in the country do the same thing. 
Okay. And Dr. Sullivan, um, are you aware if you ever performed an autopsy on a Jamari Holmes? And I, I do have a document to refresh your recollection if necessary. Yes, if I could see the document, please. Um, Your Honor, if I may use the medical examiner report to refresh your recollection, I'm happy to show it to defense counsel. It was served in discovery. Any defense counsel wish to look at it before uh, Ms. Rosenwasser presents it to Dr. Sullivan? I'd like to review that. Sure. Come on up. Jackson. All right, ma'am, you may approach the witnesses. Uh... Okay. And Dr. Sullivan, I'll encourage you to this document if you could read over it and when okay. your recollection is Yes. Dr. Sullivan, did you perform the autopsy of Mr. Jamari Holmes? Yes. And did you uh, follow all the standards and procedures that you outlined above and the best practices when you did so? Yes. Thank you. Your Honor, at this point, the state would ask the court to qualify Dr. Sullivan as an expert in forensic pathology based on her experience, background, training, and the fact that this is a well-established, accepted field of forensic science. All right. Does anybody wish to vote our Dr. Sullivan? Yes, yes. All right. Go ahead. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, you mentioned to us that um, all of your expertise is peer-reviewed. Yes. And what did you mean by that? That means that at least one other doctor reviews the report and the photographs of the autopsy before the final signature is placed on the autopsy report. Okay, thank you. And what about the things that you learned in medical school and in undergrad? Were the topics, was the subject matter you learned peer reviewed by other medical schools? Do you know? Uh, that I don't know. Okay. Um, do you know if that would be normal or out of the ordinary? I, don't have an opinion one way or the other. Okay. And why is it important that things are peer reviewed? Well, so that you aren't making a mistake um, that can easily be caught by someone else. Just to get a second, at least another pair of eyes on the report. Okay, thank you. And then uh, moving on to where you talked about an analyzing injuries, um, do you analyze gunshot wounds? Yes. And in your analysis of gunshot wounds, does that ever make conclusions about the trajectory of the bullet that caused the wound? Yes. Okay, and how do you determine that? Well, you look to see where the entrance wound on, is on a person's body and where the bullet ends, and or where there's an exit wound that corresponds to that entrance wound. And so using those two points, you can um, come up with a, a trajectory. Okay, and you're not always able to come up with that though, right? No. Okay, all right, thank you, Judge, those are my questions. All right, anybody else? Yes, sir. I just have a couple of questions for you. Now, when you say your reports are peer reviewed by somebody else in the office, is are these blind peer reviews, or does that person know you're the one that conducted this report or created this report? They know that they know. We all know who was reported as. Okay. So, well, let me ask you this: Have you ever done blind peer reviews in your office? No. All right, so whoever follows you up was basically trained the way you were trained, you're in the same office, you all work together, and they know you actually were the one that did the report. No, not, we're not all necessarily trained in the same way. Um, people can come into the office from other medical examiners, um, offices or other fellowships, so that they may have a different way of looking at things. But when you're looking at um, gunshot wounds or other injuries, you're being as objective as you can and thinking, what do I see as I look at, at this person's injuries? So 
You said the majority of the offices that are under name are all, they all follow the same procedures. Yes. But now you're also saying that there are other people that could be in your office that have been trained under different procedures. No, I said that they can, you um, stated that anyone who peer reviews another person's report in our office, we were all trained the same way. We may have been trained in the same way, but I was trained, for example, by Dr. Randy Hanslick. Um, in our, the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office. If someone is trained by um, Dr. Jason Graham up in New York City, then they are learning the same things that I'm learning, but looking at it as the way that Dr. Graham looks at, at cases. But the conclusions that you're coming to with um, injuries like gunshot wounds are, <coughs> there, there's, there's no gray, there's not gray. The thing either is or it is not a gunshot wound. So being trained by different people doesn't change the fact that if I peer reviewed a case from New York City, for example, I could see, okay, yes, that's a gunshot wound. Yes, I agree that that's an entrance. And okay, there's a, the projectile that was recovered and here's what the person said um, the internal injuries were. And I can use my own judgment to say, yes, that makes sense. So if you conduct a report and there's a possibility that the person that's peer reviewing your report, which is not blind, was taught by someone else, do they get to see all of or everything that you saw coming into the report or are they just looking at the report you created? No, they're looking at the um, circumstances under which the person's death was reported, the scene findings, the scene photographs that were taken by the investigator from our office, and then they're looking at the autopsy photos so that they're making their own decision. Okay, yes, you know, Sullivan says that this um, gunshot wound on the left side of the chest is an entrance wound. Okay, yes, I agree. If they don't agree, then we discuss, okay, I don't think that that's an entrance wound. I think that might be an exit wound, and you come to um, an agreement in, in that way. Okay, and my last question, does the person that peer reviewed your work, do they know your findings before they start the peer review, or do they, is, is it to where they make their own decision and then they realize what your, or see what your findings are? No, they know because they've got a copy of the um, preliminary report, so they know what my findings are. Right. And you said that's best practices in your in your office? Yes. All right, thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Anybody else? Since there's no clock in here, I don't know whether it's morning or afternoon. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You? Um, a couple of things. Does the <clears throat> does the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office have um, an investigator? Yes. Does the investigator do a preliminary report that is provided to you? Yes. All right. In the case, in this particular case, was there a medical examiner's investigator's report provided to you prior to your autopsy? Yes. All right. And you take into consideration those findings and <clears throat> the investigation done by the medical examiner's investigator, correct? Correct. All right. And then you start the, the autopsy. In the autopsy, do you dictate your findings? At the end, I dictate at the end of the autopsy. Some people dictate during the autopsy, but okay. I dictate at the end. And do you take any notes other than your dictation of your report. I do take notes, yes. Okay. And you, of course, maintain those notes, correct? Until I have um, finalized the report, yes. Okay. And then those notes are what, destroyed? There are a set of notes that go into the case management system that has a person's organ weights, and there may be um, a diagram on the back that shows where injuries were. 
but additional detailed notes concerning the size of a gunshot wound, et cetera. Once I've finalized the report, I don't save those notes. Okay. Notes are taken, but but only a very small slice is saved, correct? Your Honor, I'm correct. I'm going to object to this line of questioning basis. at this point. Um, my basis is that it's not relevant to the factors in Daubert of the qualification. I'm going to sustain the objection. Thank you. The... Um, <clears throat> I understood that there is a, a protocol that you follow? Yes. And is that a written protocol? No. So there is no written protocol as to what best practices are? No, and, and autopsy is a straightforward procedure. And so I do the same um, type of examination on each homicide victim or actually each autopsy I do. Okay, well, we had talked in terms of best practices. Are best practices enumerated anywhere, either in the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office or in any of the organizations that you may be involved with? And that I do not know, not okay. in our office, no. So there is, there, when you talk about best practices, there's nothing, there's no protocol, uh, written or otherwise that you follow, it's your best practice, correct? It's the best practice that I was taught following what um, people do in our office and um, according to the name guidelines. Okay, and what are the main guidelines? The name guidelines are in homicide cases that a complete autopsy is performed, looking at both internal um, evidence of natural disease and injury and examining the internal organs for natural disease and injury, retaining any projectiles or um, sharp force um, or sh uh, sharp instruments that were used to injure someone, drawing blood, vitreous fluid, urine, if necessary. I, I guess my question went to, was directed at, is this, is this um, recorded somewhere? Is there a standard by which you are guided by either nationally or locally? As well? Yeah, what exactly the, the name standards, um, the exact wording is, I do not know. But I know in order to do a complete autopsy on, pers on a person, then you have to do what I just said. Okay. Um, Dr. Randy, has published several books on forensic pathology, several versions, right? Version one, first edition, second edition. Um, have you published anything with regard to forensic pathology? No, I have not. All right. Thank you. That's all I have. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Identify yourself for record, please. <coughs> Okay. Thank you, sir. Excuse me. Mr. Eppinger. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Uh, you mentioned earlier that in your analysis or the reports that you generate, you receive a, I believe, an investigator's police report in this case? Um, a Fulton County investigator's report, yes, but that's separate from the police report. Now, do you incorporate your what you get in the investigative report in your final report? I have a section that's called um, Reason for Performing an Examination where I briefly summarize in two or three sentences why the person um, is dead and is needing an exam. And that is based on what you receive in the investigative report? Yes. Okay. And I believe you stated earlier that you are, um, your determination is to determine the cause of death, correct? The cause and manner, yes. So nothing, nothing that you do determines the circumstances of an individual's death. That is correct. And so, and in your report, do you do you include any type of, I guess, um, the word I'm looking for? Do you believe your own presumptions as far as the manner of death or the circumstances around a person's death in your report? I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. Do you include your any of your opinions regarding an individual, the circumstances surrounding a person's death, not the actual manner of death? 
um, that the person was shot in cases of homicide, that the person was shot by another individual or other individuals, plural. But nothing in your report gives anything to, as far as the identity of any individuals or anything like that. That may have been involved, you mean? Yes. No. Nothing further, Your Honor. All right. Remember, folks, this is just Daubert qualifications. It's not her trial examination. So and with that, anybody else? All right. Uh, Unless there's any specific objection, the court will qualify Dr. Sullivan in, as an expert in the area of forensic pathology. All right. Anything else, madam? Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Dr. Sullivan, I'm sorry I can't see you because uh, <laughs> monitor's hot. Good to see you, madam. Thank you. Um, please don't discuss your testimony with anybody except the attorneys in this case. Uh, we'll call you when we need you, okay? Okay. Thank you. We're going to go about your usual, du usual duties and advocation, okay? All right. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, madam. Thank you. And, Your Honor, uh, we do then have Officer Lausanne back in the back, also ready to testify. Okay. All right. Well, so let's summon uh, um, Officer Lausanne, please. And Your Honor, for any, if, if the court at any point wishes to hear any case law about the admissibility of any of the items, I do have that available as well at the court's if I need it, I'll ask you. Officers Lon, could you please uh, do me a favor and uh, approach the witness stand once you get there, if you'd be so kind to be turned and be sworn as a witness? Okay. My name is Raymond Lozon, R-A-Y-M-O-N-D-L-A-U-Z-O-N. Thank you. And uh, is it Officer Lozon, investigator? Uh, no, I'm just a civilian, so. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Now, Mr. Lozon, where do you currently work? I work with the City of Atlanta Police Department. And what is your job there? I am a latent print examiner. Okay. And how long have you worked there? I've worked for the City of Atlanta for approximately 12 years, uh, two years working as a crime scene technician and the rest working as a latent print examiner. What is your educational background? So in order to, I graduated with the University of Central Florida with a bachelor's degree in forensic science. In order to obtain that degree, I did an internship with the Brevard County Sheriff's Office, working with their latent print and their crime scene sections. During my time there, I was able to complete a research project and paper to determine the best uh, chemical for development of latent prints on paper products. And um, what is your job history? So I know you're with the Atlanta Police Department now. Did you have any history before that? Uh, no, I was, uh, like I said, I was a crime scene technician before I was promoted to the position of latent print examiner. And as a crime scene technician, did you do anything involving fingerprints? Uh, yes, we developed fingerprints on crime scenes. We examined them to determine if they were of value to be sent to the latent print section. We also reviewed cases uh, that were coming in from the officers, and we also uh, examined fingerprints that were being sent over by the jail. Now, since both of the jobs that you've had do involve that fingerprinting um, work, what kind of training did you have to do to obtain both of those jobs and to get where you are now? So the training that I did for crime scene technician was I obtained my degree with the University of Central Florida, specializing in forensic science. After that, I came up here to Atlanta, was uh, given the position with uh, Atlanta Police as a crime scene technician, and I had to complete my training down at Gypstick for uh, the Georgia Public Safety Training Center for the position of uh, crime scene technician with the state of Georgia, and I got my certificate with them. Um, that kind of classes were things like f uh, photography, crime scene, uh, crime scene processing, uh, evidence collection, uh, latent print development, latent print uh, examination. And then after that, I was given, uh, I was promoted up to the position of latent print examiner. During that time, most of my training was in-house, working with the other latent examiners, training with them. And I also was able to attend uh, different seminars by the Ron Smith and Associates 
uh, agency working with them. And I was also able to go to the, the uh, American Academy of Forensic Science conference that was held here. And did all of those trainings sort of touch on that interest of fingerprints, including the conference? Yes, it did. Okay. Now, so from, if I'm doing my math correctly, you've been doing this since at least about 2011. Um, I know this is probably going to be a huge number, but can you ballpark about how many fingerprint analyses you've done ever? Analyses is somewhere over probably 10,000 working cases. Okay. Have you ever been qualified as an expert witness before? Is this your first time? Uh, yes, I've been qualified. Okay. Um, was it here in Fulton County? Yes, it was. Do you know about how many times? Uh, somewhere around between 15 and 20. Uh, I've also worked with Fulton County Juvenile Court and also the U.S. Uh, federal Court. So were you qualified under the Daubert standard in federal court? I knowledge? do not remember if they did that. No, no problem. Um, but you, were you qualified as an expert in federal court? Yes, I was. And what were you qualified as an expert in, both in federal court and state court? Uh, latent examination, fingerprint examination. Okay. Your Honor, at this point, I would like to um, approach the witness with what's been marked as State's Exhibit 2. It is his CV, and I'd like to move it into evidence. I do have copies available. If the Defense Counsel would like to review it, it has been provided. All right. Anybody wish to take a look at that before she approaches the witness? All right. Yes, ma'am. You may go ahead and... What exhibit number is that? This is the exhibit two, unless the court would like you to do a different one for you. That's fine. That's no, fine. Seem to be all ongoing here. No, that's okay. Sir, you will please just take a look at this document and see if you recognize it. Uh, yes, this looks like the CV that I submitted. So is this your uh, CV that you were submitted with your experience? Yes. Does there appear to be any changes, alterations, deletion, substitutions? There does not appear to be, no. Your Honor, at this point, I would like to move State's Exhibit 2, which is Mr. Lazan's uh, CV into evidence for the purposes of this hearing. Any objection by any defense counsel? No objection, Your Honor. All right. Having hearing none, uh, State's 2, uh, Mr. Lazan's CV will be admitted for purposes of the motion. Thank you, Your Honor. Who said no objection? I heard it was. I'm sorry, that's me, Menendez. Remember, if there is, if you have a specific objection, please tell me. If in the event that you don't, I'm going to assume that a silence means that you, you, there is no objection. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Lazan, do you ever have to take any proficiency tests to make sure that you're up to date with everything and doing your job correctly? Uh, yes, we take a yearly proficiency test since we attained accreditation with the ANAB organization as yeah. part of our lab. When was the last time you took your test? Uh, the last time I took the test was in January of this year. What's AMAD, please, sir? Uh, ANAB is the ANSI. Uh, National Accreditation Board, ANSI, is the American National Standards Institute. And how did you perform on your proficiency test, if I may ask? Uh, I was able to pass it with 100% uh, accuracy. Thank you. Now, is the, are you with the Atlanta Police Department Crime Lab, is that correct? That is correct. And is that crime lab also accredited by any, I think you referenced that? Yes, we are. And what is that agency accredited with? Uh, we are accredited with the ANAB, which is uh, the American or ANSI National Accreditation Board, and ANSI is the American National uh, American National Standards Institute. Okay, and is that what what is that organization? Uh, you know? It's an accrediting body. They come out and they review us to make sure that we are following the standards that are set forth by ISO. And what is ISO? Uh, ISO is the standards. Uh, inst Institute, I believe. Is uh, that agency directly for fingerprint examiners or other crime labs? It's actually for, uh, it's a national accrediting, uh, national standards institute for the entire world, basically, uh, to check lab work. Okay. Now, what kind of fingerprinting testing do you do? Can you explain it briefly to us? Uh, so in our lab, we use the ACE-V methodology. ACE-V is analysis, comparison, evaluation, and verification. Uh, in the analysis phase, we're going to be looking, for, looking at a latent print to determine if it is sufficient for uh, individualization. 
And in that, we're looking at three different levels of detail. We're looking at the first level of detail being the general ridge flow and pattern. The next level of detail being the individual characteristics or what we call minutia. We're looking at the bifurcations, ridge endings, and dots that are present in a print. And then we're going to be moving into level three, which would be the individual characteristics on a ridge, such as the pore placement, ridge edges, anything like that. Uh, after we do that, we're going to be going into our comparison. In the comparison part, we're going to have submitted the print into the APHIS, which is the Automated Fingerprint Identification System, and it's going to come back with some results. Those results are then compared by us. In that comparison, we're looking at the known information that we have obtained during the analysis phase and comparing that to a known standard. And no matter what we determine, we're then going to move on to the next stage, which is evaluation. In evaluation, we're going to be making one of three determinations. Either it's going to be individualization, an exclusion, or it's incon uh, inconclusive. And individualization means that the information that we see present in the unknown that we established during the analysis phase is present in the known sample, and therefore we make a determination that they are from the same source. The exclusion says that the information present in the, known, in the unknown sample is not present in the known sample, so we would rule that person out as a possible source. And then the last is inconclusive, meaning that the information present may be in agreement, but we are not able to make a definitive determination that it was made by the same source. The last step of that phase, or the process is then going to be a verification phase. In the verification phase, we're going to give our work over to a second qualified examiner. They're going to review the work and determine, uh, they're going to actually be looking at it to see the negative. If they, if we've determined an individualization, they're going to be looking at it, trying to find in, that it's an exclusion. Based on that, if they cannot find any errors, they would have to approve our work and sign that as a verification. And how did you learn to do that testing? It's obviously fairly complex. I learned to do it both from uh, study uh, with the uh, degree program that I took, and we also learned it from working with the other examiners and also from classes that we took with the Ron Smith and Associates as well as at Gypsic. Okay. Um, now, I wanna make sure I understand because I don't have that science background. Uh, if I'm understanding your testimony, if these tests are shown are done correctly, they will show either that the fingerprint is a match, that it's not a match, or that it's unconclusive, whether it's a match or not. Is that a fair reflection, or have I gotten it wrong? That's correct. Okay. And why would this? Why is, are these tests done generally? Uh, they're done to try to determine the identity of somebody who had left latent prints on a scene or sometimes we're also uh, tasked with doing them to determine the identity of a deceased. Okay, so if some, is it that a situation where if someone's passed away, you're determining who they Who were? they were if there's no identifying information, yes. Okay. Now, are you aware if any other law enforcement officers, agencies, or other crime labs like APD use this, uh, I think you said it was the ACE? The ACE, ACE v methodology. ACE v methodology? Uh, yes, it is pretty much the only accepted methodology that we use. Is that in Georgia or across the country? Or uh, everywhere? Worldwide, as far as I'm aware. Okay. Um, do you know if any any information about this ACEV testing has been published in like a book, a magazine, um, publication, anything like that? Uh, there have been many books written about uh, ACEV. There have also been several articles written about it and it's been discussed uh, in length in uh, journals. Uh, the most common journals are going to be the uh, the Journal of Forensic Science, which is published by the AAFS, uh, the American Academy of Forensic Science, as well as the Journal of Forensic Identification, which is the journal that's written by the International Association for Identification. And are there any standards that control how this test is performed to make sure that you or anyone else doing it is doing it correctly? Uh, yes, we have to follow by first within our own agency, we have our SOPs, the standard operating procedures that we have to follow along with. Uh, beyond that, there is also the uh, guidelines that are set forth by the ISO, uh, as well as the general standards that are, pro that are published by uh, what used to be called the SWIGFAST, which was the standard working group uh, for, for, in, or for fingerprint ridge analysis uh, study and technology. 
And then that was rolled into what they call the OSAC now, and they actually adopted most of the standards that they published. So based on all those standards, is there a set of best practices to follow when conducting these examinations? Yes, there is. And do you follow both the standards we discussed and the best practices we discussed uh, when you conduct those tests? Yes. And generally, when I say best practices, are those the same standards we talked about, or is there something else to add to that? Uh, the standards are going to give us the best practices, yes. Okay. And so are those published somewhere? Somebody could read them over if they wanted to or review them? Yes, they are. Do you know where? Uh, SwigFast maintains a website, and so does the OSAC. And are there written protocols, procedures on those websites? Yes, there are. Okay. So if you had a question or someone else did, they could... They could refer to those, yes. Thank you. Um, now, in this particular case, uh, obviously encompassing multiple cases, have you tested several fingerprints in this case? Uh, yes, I have. Okay. Um, I'm th showing, if I may approach with three documents, I don't intend to admit them into evidence. I just would like to uh, show him and confirm that these are his reports. Does anyone object to that? I'm so sorry. Uh, I was planning to show him three documents simply to show, to confirm that these are the three documents he did in this case and then put it on the record, the case numbers. Can I see both bristles, please? Sure, and I do have them available. As long as you ident uh, identify yes. them as a state exhibit for the purpose of the record, just, even if you're not going to admit them. Okay, I certainly can do that. I can also go ahead and admit them for the purposes of this hearing if the court would. Whatever your pleasure, ma'am. I'll do that. This one applies to. I don't believe so. I'll admit them for the purposes of the hearing. I think Effinger stuff. Fleetwood, it's Fleetwood and Effinger and BB. Not to my knowledge. All right. So I have what's been marked for the purposes of this hearing, states one, two, and three. Um, uh, you have states one and two already. So. Oh, I'm sorry, three, four, and five, Your Honor. That'd be fine. Okay. And these were what I made available to defense counsel during our recess, but I'm, if anyone else would like to view them, I have them here. All right, you may approach. I may approach, thank you. Recognize documents three, four, and five? Yes, I do. And how do you recognize those documents? Uh, these are reports that I had prepared for these cases. Okay. And for each of the three documents, did you follow the best practices and standards that we discussed earlier? Uh, yes. And to your knowledge, those cases involved defendants Fleetwood, Eppinger, and Beebe? Uh, yes, I uh, believe they did. Your Honor, if I may admit them for the purposes of this hearing, states exhibit three, four, and five. All right, Mr. Fleetwood's counsel, any objection? Again, sir. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, Mr. Fleetwood, do you have any objection, sir? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, Mr. Eppinger, do you have any, uh, Mr. Eppinger, or your counsel, do you have any objections? No objection for the purposes of this hearing. All right. And uh, Mr. Beebe's counsel? Uh, no objection for this hearing, Your Honor. Okay, all right. Your Honor, uh, Sean Hoover, in regards to Mr. Fleetwood, um, it has to be shown that Mr. Fleetwood does not have an attorney. Does not have legal representation, and he's not prepared to, to answer any of those questions. Well, you're not representing him. Remember, okay? He has the right if he, since he's self-represented, since he's not 
Since no counsel has been appointed, he certainly can speak up for himself if he wishes to do so. I, I provide him or anybody else who doesn't have counsel with that particular same, same ability. I understand that he does not have an attorney as of yet, um, but you know that's, that's, that's just the way we are at this point in time. So when you get him an attorney, if that, that attorney wishes to reevaluate anything that has been presented thus far, that person can do so and file particularized motions or any other issues at that point in time. Yes, Your Honor, and I just want to make sure it's clear on the record that all these questions that are be asked to him, he does not have legal representation. I, I, sure. I understand that, sir, and, I, and I'll understand, and I'll say for the record, he is a he is not represented by counsel as of yet because we haven't been able to appoint him counsel, and that we have been attempting to do so since May of this year. Right. All right. All right, Mr. Flea, would you have a question, sir? Okay, that's all right. That's all right. You're good. When, like I said, when an attorney's appointed to represent you, sir, you will then your attorney can go ahead and particularize or 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 or, um, or object to anything that that's been done so far. Okay. It's on your own. I ain't even had a chance to get an attorney on my case. I've been on 24 hour lockdown. You told me that the last couple times you've been here, Mr. Mr. Hoop. Okay, well, Mr. Hoover's working on getting you an attorney at this point in time, but you uh, you don't need to say anything else, okay? All right. Madam. That's all I have. I'm okay, all right. Then uh, states three, four, and five are admitted for purposes of motion. Okay. There you Your Honor, at this point, we would ask the court to qualify Mr. Lausanne as an expert in latent fingerprint examination based on his experience, background training, and the fact that this is a well-established, accepted field of forensic science. Um, and we would just ask that he qualify, that this court qualify the expert as such. Okay, for those uh, folks that are where this particular uh, expert would apply, counsels, do you have any specific objection to qualifying Mr. Lausanne as a fingerprint expert? And, uh, Your Honor, we. Uh, you said what was you what was you asking me to qualify him as? Latent, uh, latent fingerprints examiner, and we do just want to note that all the evidence in this case is is technically admissible against all the defendants because it is a RICO. I do have a brief question. Yes, sir. Um, I know you're not representing the defendant. Okay, so uh, you shared with us that you compare a known print to an unknown print? Uh, we actually compare the, we work from the unknown print to the known print. Okay, and then sometimes you're able to say with a certain degree of confidence that this known print is coming from the same person as the unknown print, right? We, we would say from the same source, yes. From the same source. And then do you assign any kind of confidence level to that, like 50%, 70%? Uh, no, we don't have a confidence in role that we've assigned to that. We would normally say that it is determined to be from the same source. Okay, so you're 100% sure? Uh, within, uh, within the realm of possibility that there is a chance that there is a, another person that exists with that exact same fingerprint, we do acknowledge that that can happen. However, we have yet to have an example of that be presented to us. So we can't say with a 100% confidence, but within the realm of uh, what we've seen over the past 100 years. Okay, and you also have seen partial prints, correct? Yes. And sometimes you can have an opinion about where a partial print came from, the source? Uh, we do make opinions based on partial prints, yes, but they have to have within them a certain level of detail that makes us uh, confident that that would actually be attributable, attributable to a source. Okay, so how much detail does there have to be for you to be just as confident as you are in your other answers? Uh, it would have to be based on a sliding scale, which is based on the quality and the quantity of information present. So with something that is a relatively low quality print, we would want to have even more information present in that print to be, uh, to be confident that that would actually be from a same source. With a high quality print, 
there may be less information present, but we would still need a certain amount of that present. Okay, so the higher quality of the print, the higher the confidence level. Uh, the higher quality of the print, it would depend on the amount of information that is present in that print still. Okay, and you then sometimes compare these prints to databases? Uh, yes, they are compared against the local, state, and federal database, depending on the quality of the print. And how do individuals get in that database? Uh, they can get into those databases in multiple ways. Uh, I'm actually within our state and our uh, local, actually, I'm, uh, excuse me, I'm within our local database as I was applied for a job with the Atlanta police. Uh, people get into local databases through many different ways. Uh, we actually get people coming in for applications, uh, to get permits, to get uh, licenses, things like that. And then, of course, there's also people that are being arrested. And within the state, you have the same kind of thing where you're going to have people that are applying for jobs. And the same thing within the federal level. You're going to have people that are applying for jobs with banking and sometimes even people practicing law are going to be fingerprinted to have their uh, jobs background checked. Okay. Is there a way for someone outside of law enforcement to find out whether or not they're in one of these databases? Uh, I I'm not entirely sure. Okay. And you did mention that you learned some of what you learned from a degree program? Uh, yes. What was the degree program? Uh, the University of Central Florida bachelor's degree in forensic science. Okay. And you were taught by professors at the school? I was taught by professors at the school, yes. Are you aware of the educational qualifications of the professors that taught you? Uh, I am aware of the main professor who taught us, yes. What does that have to do with him? I'm getting there, Judge. All right, move along. Let's hurry yeah. it up. Um, so where I was getting at with that is, um, are you aware whether or not the work of your professors and their knowledge was peer-reviewed by their peers? Uh, yes, they actually that, had published. That relevant? It, it's him, not his professors. It's him. And, and, Your Honor, that's where he learned what he learned from. So. Still, it's him. You're not going back one level before. That's not proper. Okay. You're challenging him. Remember, his knowledge, skill, expertise, training, or education. Okay. And just to back up and be clear, you, you were taught by professors, correct? Yes, I was. Okay. Were you ever involved in peer reviewing any of their work? Uh, not peer reviewing their work, no. Okay. Because uh, you're not one of their peers? Yes. Okay. And not at that time, no. Yeah, I don't want to object to that. He's... I sustain the objection. Okay. Um, you talked about gaining knowledge from books and articles that are written in journals, correct? That is correct. And you're aware that, um, do you have any knowledge about whether the writers of those articles had those articles peer reviewed? Uh, I'm going to object. I sustain the objection. Okay. And you talked about having a certain methodology and standard operating procedures? That's correct. And it's important that you follow those every time? That's correct. And why is that important? It's important so that it sets a standard for the work that we do so that we can testify to that in courts. Okay. Would you be comfortable doing your work without a methodology? No. Okay. Thank you, Judge. All right. Anybody else? Yes, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Hoover. Sean Hoover on behalf of Mr. Layla, or Layla, Mr. Sumlin. Um, you spoke briefly about your proficiency tests. Mm -hmm. You said you passed with 100%? That's correct. So are those tests pass-fail? Uh, they are actually pass-fail uh, within our agency. If you do not get 100%, then you would fail. Okay. How many have you taken? I've taken two within the past uh, two years. In your career, how many have you taken? Uh, just those two because we were not going through accreditation before that. Right. So you've never failed a proficiency test in your career up to this point? That's correct. All right. And can you give us the error rate of your reports when you are actually conducting reports and um, analysis on fingerprints? Uh, we, uh, based on the prior experience, we would have to say that it was 100% due to the proficiency tests. So it's your testimony that you, as an examiner, has are, are you're 100% you're when it comes to the tests, and you're 100% when it comes to the actual reports that you're generating from these comparisons. That would have to be the conclusion only because we don't have anything else to base it on as of right now, because we don't know ground truth when we actually are doing these work. So you've never failed in your career as an examiner. Uh, at this point, no, I have not. Okay. Um, in regards to the database that you're talking about, could you please, in your expert opinion, explain how that algorithm matches whatever prints that you got to whatever prints that it picks up in the computer? Okay. I can. I think I'm going to object to that question. It, it doesn't go directly to um, reliability. His method is asking how essentially a computer program works. I don't. We're not trying to qualify him that computer program, just in the actual print analysis. And, Your Honor, I don't believe that's true. We just got 
this gentleman saying he's been literally perfect in his entire career, and he also uses his database. That's information that he uses to create this perfect um, report. I want, to, I want oh, in uses, his professional opinion, to- He uses the database to compare prints. It's a, it's a repository of prints. Is that correct, sir? That is correct. All right, so that's part of his, that's part of his, what he does in terms of, of um, his comparison. So do you have anything else in regards to that? Yes. Can you, expl can you explain to us how it works to, to, to verify your comparison? How it works to verify our comparison? Yeah, no, it doesn't verify our comparison. Okay, then what exactly does it do? Uh, it generates a list of candidates based on the information that is put into it. So we would what mark looking, up... What are you looking for specifically? Ridges we're looking world, for... Ridges, worlds, points of comparison. Tell them a little bit about that. Okay. So what we're looking for when we're actually putting in a print is we're going to take an image of it, then we're going to mark it up based on what we see. So when I talked earlier about the analysis phase, that's what we're looking at, is the different levels of detail that are present in a print. So when we're looking at the analysis, we're looking at what the pattern type is, what the original general ridge flows are, and then when we get into level two detail, that's when we're actually looking for the individual characteristics, which are gonna be the, what we call the minutia. So we're looking at bifurcations, ridge endings, and dots that are present in the print. We're then going to mark those onto that image that is sent, and it's going to, able, it's going to review the distance between those individual events within how many ridges are in between each one of those events. It's then going to submit that off to the database where it's going to review all the candidates looking for similarities between what we've put in and what is in the database. So I guess it only searches what you've noticed as the different swirls and loops and ridges and all that. It doesn't look at anything else but what you've put in yourself, right? That's correct. All right. And if you don't know if you've ever failed how do we know what the computer generates comes out is actually correct as well? Uh, well, what we do is we're going to actually review each one of those candidates that comes back. We're looking at them to see if there is a comparison that we can make in between those. And then once that's done, we're actually going to, if we find something that says, yes, this is that person, it then has to be reviewed by a second candidate or by a second qualified examiner. It has to be reviewed by a second, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part you said? Qualified examiner. Qualified examiner. Okay, now is that examiner someone that's in your office as well? Yes. Trained like you? Uh, for the most part, yes. Takes the test like you? Yes. All right, no further questions, thank you. All right, anyone else? All right, um, if there being no other examination, the court will uh, qualify Mr. Lazan in the area of latent fingerprint examination. All right, anything else? No, Your Honor. Um, if the court, so per the court's request, I'll have reached out. Hold on one second. Oh. Ms. Lozon, mm -hmm. uh, and you, you're free to go about your usual duties and advocation just on discussion testimony of anybody except the attorneys in this case. We'll call you when we need you, okay? Okay. All right, thank you, sir. I appreciate you. Ms. Rosenwasser, you're about to say something. I apologize. Yes. Go for ahead. For the, the court's request um, for, for different witnesses this afternoon, I know the court mentioned Ms. Scott. I reached out to Ms. Scott. She has been able to uh, obtain child care with her husband this afternoon. So if, if uh, the court would like to have her testimony, I can get her in this afternoon. As That'd a, be wonderful. As a, would, and then I can have Deputy Hall come tomorrow morning as planned if the court would be amenable to that. Okay, um, is there anybody else? I would say maybe we should uh, uh, have Ms. Scott come in at 2.30. Okay. Would that work for, for you? And uh, that would give everybody an opportunity to have some lunch. Is there anybody else um, that we can call in this afternoon that might be from the other days that you have uh, any of the people on the 21st or 22nd? Uh, one moment, please. So obviously we have Investor Hall, but that is gonna be a lengthier one. Um, so we can have him in as scheduled. Give me one moment, Your Honor, to pull up the schedule. Um, trying to make sure that everybody. I would just, I would just ask you that you know, or you or your team, um, reach out to see if there's anybody on the 20 who's, except for the gang experts, okay, because they're going to take a little bit longer. But 
if we can potentially move up some of those folks so that I can actually hear, you know, we can have we can have a little bit more time because they'll take a little bit of time. Um, other, um, Mr. Hall will probably take a little bit of time or more so that uh, if we can clear Ms. Scott and Mr. Pinea this afternoon, that would be great. I, uh, Your Honor, I believe Mr. Pinea was only available tomorrow, but um, we can clear Ms. Scott this afternoon. Um, I can call Ms. Brennan from the 21st and see if she can come in after. Yeah, just check with, just recheck with everybody else and just say, hey, look, we have an opportunity to move you up a little bit and, you know, we might be able to, we might be able to do that. That would be, that would be helpful. That would, that would allow us to at least spend as much time as necessary with Mr. Hall tomorrow. Um, I'll let you and your team kind of, um, kind of continue to work with that and um, we can then, but we'll, but in the absence of that, we'll continue with, with Ms. Scott at, at 2.30 today, okay? Thank you, and I'll try to find somebody else to come after her as well. Okay, all right. Thank you. Or any of the other days, like uh, like uh, your firearms expert from the, tw uh, and um, what's the NIBIN expert, what's that? That's the NIBIN, that's how they identify the firearms. Um, we don't, and he is on, the first day that he's available is the 22nd, so that's how okay. we have him there. All right. Um, the firearms expert, I know that his presentation is probably going to be a couple hours just because of how detailed the ballistics are. Okay. So um, we, and one of our cell site location information, uh, both of those individuals are, one of them is in Alabama, so he had been planning to come for Wednesday. I can see if I can get the other individual to come today if the court would like to stay later. That's, well, I was going to ask you, is Ms. Holm, Van Holm, the firearms expert? And Mr. Voss, the firearms expert, are they available? Unfortunately, both of them are not available until next week, but we do have Mr. Tanner coming. And I'll put the court on notice now, with the experts such as the forensic chemists and the firearms expert, once we have that first expert testify, um, like for example, we had the medical examiner testify about the reliability of the science itself, we probably just need to do the qualifications and we would ask the court to take judicial notice that it had already found the science itself reliable. So that may those would be fairly short witnesses next week would be our anticipation. Okay. All right. But we'll certainly try to see if we can get, uh, I just confirmed with Ms. Scott, she can absolutely be here at 2.30 in person, and I will call Ms. Lowry and see if she'd be able to come, or Ms. Brennan and see if she'd be able to come in after that. That's fine. Okay. All right. Councils, then we'll be in recess until 2.30. We'll come back and take up those, at least uh, Ms. Scott and any other, uh, the other shorter witnesses. Uh, and then we'll uh, we'll make plans for uh, plans for tomorrow. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Well, all right, we're in recess. I think it's a
All right, folks, uh, good afternoon. We're back on the record. Uh, this afternoon? Your Honor, I was able to get Brittany Scott with the GBI and Morgan Brennan also with the GBI. Okay, all right. Well, let's go ahead. Ms. Scott, good afternoon, madam. If you would please approach the witness stand. Once you get there, if you'd be so kind to turn and face Debbie's talk and be sworn as a witness. You're ready, Brian? You swear in front of the courts of truth to hold you. Yes. Brittany, B R I T T A N Y S C O T T. Good afternoon, Ms. Scott. Where are you currently employed? I'm employed at the Georgia Bureau of Investigations, Division of Forensic Science, which is also known as the State Crime Lab. And how long have you been there? Uh, for a little over nine years. Now, where were you before that, or was that your first job out of college? That was my first job out of college. So what was uh, your educational background before going to the GBI? I obtained my Bachelor's of Science degree in Chemistry from the Georgia Institute of Technology, and shortly after that, I obtained my position at the GBI Crime Lab. Now, at the GBI Crime Lab, what is your out there? Um, I've always been a forensic chemist, either as a trainee or a scientist. What are some of the jobs that you do there, your responsibilities or duties day to day? I test different items of, of controlled substances. Now, to be able to do that, do you need to get any kind of certification? Education at uh, Georgia Tech. Yes. Uh, once I obtained my job at the GBI Crime Lab, I underwent about a year-long training program um, where I learned all about the different controlled substances um, through different written, oral, and um, practical examinations. Following that, every year we have to do a certain number of hours of training that is relevant to our field of expertise. So is that sort of a continuing education? Yes. What are some topics of those trainings? Uh, usually they have to pertain with, you know, things that are relevant. So in the last few years, it's been a lot more based on fentanyls and their analogs, um, THC and THC products. Um, those have been some of the more prominent trainings recently. Do you need to be certified in anything to do this? Or is this just that your education authorizes you to do that with the continued training? Yes, the, the educational background and the training program at the GBI Crime Lab is enough um, to, for us to perform our duties. Okay, and have you ever taught any trainings or other classes about this or given presentations? Yes, I have. Can you describe those? Um, yes, for years I was one of the cocaine school instructors where we um, taught, it was about a day-long training course at the um, Georgia 
Georgia Public Safety Training Center, um, where I taught different officers about different forms of cocaine, what it looks like, um, how it's used, um, that kind of stuff. Um, I also did a presentation at the Georgia Institute of after I've graduated. You know, to give them an overview of what all different opportunities there are at the crime lab. Thank you, Your Honor. And this with what's been marked as State's Exhibit 6. Uh, it's been provided to all defendants. I do have a copy here, should any of the attorneys wish to have their own copy. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Ma'am, do you recognize this document? Yes, I do. What is this document? Um, it is my CV. And have there been any alterations? The only other addition, I believe, under the trainings and meetings attended to say that the list was not all inclusive. When I would like to move uh, State 6 of 6 into evidence. Any objection to State 6? Hearing no objection is admitted. Thank you. <clears throat> now, what types of substances do you test at the GBI? Uh, we test different items of, of evidence for any types of controlled substances. Now, have you ever been qualified as an expert before? Four times? Uh, probably around 40 times. Is that all? or state court or in Fulton County or other counties? Uh, Fulton County and other counties. Okay. Um, tested the components of pills. Like if you get a pill, can you test and decide what kind of drug it is? Yes, I have. Can you briefly describe the process for determining, for example, relevant to this case, if a pill is an oxycodone pill? Yes. Uh a test that I would do is a logo identification test. Um, I will look at the tablets that I have received, um, including its shape, its color, its logo, any imprint markings, and I will compare it to um, a known reference material either in books or online. Um, I will if the tablet that I'm looking at in person matches um, the reference that I'm referring to. Uh, following that, the next test most often performed is a gas chromatography mass spectrometry test. Um, and I did miss the, after doing the logo identification, if it um, qualifies, I will take a weight of the tablets as well. Now what, I'm not gonna remember the word you just said. What is the gas matro, uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometry. Can you explain that test? Yes, so it's a very specific kind of two-part technique. Um, the first component, the gas chromatography part, will allow any components that are present in the evidence to be separated. The mass spectrometry portion is the instrument's detector. So basically any component that the gas chromatography portion separates, the mass spectrometer will detect it and produce a spectrum that can be compared to known reference material. Now, is, is this test accurate? Do you know how often it's accurate or whether it has a rate of accuracy? Uh, so it doesn't quite have a rate of accuracy as, as it is a qualitative measurement um, versus a quantitative measurement or a numerical measurement. Um, really this test kind of works, the data is produced and then myself as a scientist evaluates the data to see whether it meets the requirements. What are I guess some requirements that it might meet? Can you explain that to someone with no science background like myself? Yes, so for the, the gas chromatography mass spectrometry test. Excuse me, Sean Hoover, I have an objection. What's your basis? It, it looks like the witness is looking down and reading from something. I'm not sure if there's anything put into evidence that she's allowed to read from. I'm just a little right. concerned with what she's looking at that we don't have. I believe that's a, her subpoena right there. Yeah, it is. That's the only thing, okay. Um, there, there's other papers underneath, but I can't see them through the paper. Okay, it's, you can, I mean, you can take, I can put them somewhere else. You just kept looking down and making sure you don't have something that we, the rest of us don't have, that's all. I have no objection to 
getting them and putting them over here. If it's Why don't you do that? And Mr. Hoover would like to see what she was looking at. That's fine, too. I believe as long as it's not something that the rest of us don't have. No. Okay. All right. Continue. I believe I was asking how the, the different components match or how you would determine that. Yes, so for that gas chromatography mass spectrometry test, um, I can either compare the spectrum that I received to known reference material, or a standard can be run on the instrument and I can compare the spectrum that way. Okay. Now, if a test like this is done correctly, what will it show when you're done with the test? Um, in the case that you mentioned of Oxycodone, if, if it is a positive test for oxycodone, then the spectrum um, obtained from the tablet that was tested would match that of a known reference material or standard. And sometimes, does it not match sometimes or it does match sometimes? Correct, yes. What do you do if it doesn't match? Um, if it doesn't match, I will either see if there are other components that are in there and determine what those components may be, or sometimes um, there, there is nothing. It, it is a negative test, um, and I would move forward with pursuing a negative result. Okay. Um, is drug testing like the way that you test? Yes, so our reports are subject to peer review. Can you explain that? Yes, so um, our peer review process works. Um, another trained scientist in the same regards that I've been um, will look at the report and all of the data that's been generated to see if they would come to the same conclusion. So the methods of testing that the GBI used that uses, are those published in a textbook anywhere? Do they come from, you know, a training? Is this any way an accepted science? Yes, both. Um, so all of the different methods used have been published in articles, and um, they are also all extensively covered in our training program. Do other laboratories in the United States or anywhere use the same types of methods that you use? I again, have immediately forgotten the word that you said to describe it, but that test. Yes. The gas chromatography mass spectrometry test, yes, other labs do use it. Okay, is that nationally or just in Georgia? Yes, but both in Georgia and nationally. Okay. Are there any standards that control how these tests are performed to make sure that people are doing them accurately? Yes, there are. Can you describe those, please? Um, yeah, so there's a few different standards that can be followed. Um, one set of standards that we follow are the SWIG drug guidelines. Um, another set of standards that, or another set of guidelines that we will follow are the OSAC guidelines. And I'm sorry, can you explain the SWIG drug guidelines, please? Yes, so the SWIG drug stands for a scientific working group. Um, and so basically this this group or this committee will come up with different standards um, that are published and for all labs to be able to reference to use. Okay, and the other guidelines you mentioned as well, are those published? Yes. Okay. Is there any specific best practice or standard that you follow at the GBI, or is it both of those or anything else that I haven't mentioned? Yes, it includes both of those as well as all of our um, GBI policies as well. Okay. Um, in this particular case, uh, did you test oxycodone? Yes, I did. And is that uh, DOFS case 2021-1024101, to your knowledge? Yes. Okay. When you did that, did you follow all those best practices? Yes, I did. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, I would like to request this court to qualify Ms. Scott as an expert in forensic chemistry based on her experience, background, training, and the fact that this science of drug testing is well-established and an accepted field of forensic science. All right. So um, you explained to us that you're, you consider yourself a scientist? Yeah, I'm a forensic scientist, forensic chemist. Okay, and when you're doing this testing, um, you mentioned whether or not a tablet matches a reference. Uh, what did you mean by the reference? Um, so for the, are you asking about the logo identification test yeah. specifically? Yes, so I will look at the tablets that I receive, um, and then I will look at a reference material to see if they visually are consistent. Okay, and so um, you're following the scientific method when you do that? 
Yes. And that's because it involves a control group and an experimental group, correct? So again, this is just one part, this is just one, te one test um, that correlates to an entire result. Um, so there's not exactly an experimental um, group. This is just one comparison test to see if the tablets are visually consistent. Um, from there, I then do additional chemi chemical tests. Okay, and in the scientific method, what, just explain to us very briefly, why is there often a control group and an experimental group when you do scientific studies? Um, to just, a control group is one that you would, that you know, kind of know what to expect, um, and so that way you can determine um, based on the results that you get on your control group, if what the experimental group, the results are showing, if they can be determined to be accurate. Okay, thanks. And um, if you didn't have a control group and an experimental group, you wouldn't be able to know whether there's just a correlation or causation, correct? Correct, and, and again, this is why the logo identification test is not used solely to determine um, the identity of a tablet. Okay, and uh, you mentioned fentanyl, that wasn't always around during your career, correct? It's just not necessarily all of the different analogs that we are seeing now, and, and not as prevalent as we are seeing now. Okay, uh, how do you keep up to date on the new analogs that might be coming out? Your Honor, I'm gonna object to this line of questioning. Uh, she was certified as a forensic chemist, but this specific on the test, I'm sorry, to oxycodone. Uh, I'm not sure if fentanyl is relevant to this questioning, Your Honor. It is, Your Honor. Fentanyl is often used as an analog to give people the same experience as oxycodone, and I'm just getting at how she keeps up to date on the new is it drugs. relevant for this case? Yes, Your Honor. <laughs> I'm asking how she keeps up to date on new what I asked of testing. Is it relevant for this case? Meaning, is somebody going to, do, do we have tablets that are taken or drugs that are, uh, in terms of, uh, that are going to be an issue in this case of that particular type? Uh, not that I know of, Judge, but my relevance was more aimed at her as an expert for the purposes of Daubert. Okay, but she's test for she's a for, you're, you're, she's being sought to be at, um, qualified as a forensic chemist. Right. So, if you are asking about something that is going to be irrelevant in this case, then fine. If it's not, I'm gonna I'm gonna basically sustain the objection for relevancy. Right, Your Honor. It was only to gauge her. As an expert, she hasn't been qualified yet as an expert, so I just want to know how she keeps up to date on new developments in her field. Okay, well, I think that's fair enough. Okay. Right. How, how do you stay up to date on new developments in your field, such as new analogs of drugs that might come out, synthetic drugs? Yeah, so part of those um, hours of training that we have to get every year, um, again, a lot of them in recent years, the past couple of years, a lot of them have been um, more focused on fentanyl and the analogs. So um, attending those trainings, um, either in person or virtually, that does help to keep up to date on the different trends that we're seeing um, and different analytical techniques. Okay, and those trainings are conducted by people outside of GBI? Um, both. Some are internal and some are, you know, in the state of Georgia, some are nationwide, some are worldwide. So. Okay. And um, do you also involve yourself with any um, articles? Have you ever been published? Uh, I have been published um, back in college, so it's been a minute, but yes. Okay, cool. And was what you published uh, peer-reviewed by other scientists? I believe so. Okay, and why is that important? Um, why is it important to have something peer-reviewed? Um, just to yes. make sure that other people um, that are in, in the same type of field um, would agree and come to the same conclusions. Okay, cool. And so it's um, fair to say that it's important to have a methodology in your field? I would say so, yes. Okay, would you be comfortable doing testing and identifying data without operating under a methodology? Mr. Menace, what does that have to do with anything? You're That's still, my remember, final remember it's a Daubert qualification. This isn't weight sufficiency or before a jury. Your questions are perfectly fine if she gets qualified and we put her in, she, 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 she testifies in front of a jury. That was my final question, Your Honor. All right, you sit down then. Well, I was waiting for the answer. What was the question you asked? Whether she would be comfortable identifying data without using a methodology. That, that again, that's another, doesn't really go to her qualifications. That's a weight and sufficiency question. Okay, I'll, I'll take the court's objection, but for the record, I, I just, it's relevant to her as an as expert. 
Madam, you want to answer that question? Oh, the question that he yes. asked? Um, again, it, can, can you repeat it? Because I right. got you, distracted. You operate under certain scientific methodologies when you're identifying data, correct? Yes. Okay, so it's fair to say you would not be comfortable as a scientist operating without a methodology. Yes, but I would always, we always work under having some sort of methodology, yes. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions, Your Honor. Anyone else? Okay. Um, based upon what the court has heard in terms of testimony, the court will qualify Ms. Brittany Scott as an expert in the area of forensic chemistry. Okay, Ms. Uh, Ms. Scott. Sorry, I can't see you. I apologize. It's okay. Uh, Madam, um, we'll call you when we need you. Um, okay. But please don't discuss your testimony with anybody except your attorney in this case, okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, madam. I call you next witness, please. Your Honor, State will call uh, Ms. Morgan Brennan. Ms. Morgan Brennan? Yeah. Okay, summon Mr. Brennan, please. Sure, Ms. Ms. Brennan, is it Ms. Brennan or Mr. Brennan? Ms. Brennan. Okay, all right. Ms. Gladden, what can we what can I answer for you? Your Honor, I do not have any questions and have not had questions or objections to you, any of the experts that have been presented today. I think I just needed to make a record that since it is a RICO case and every expert and all of the testimony does affect my client in some way, um, I just want to again say that, of course, I just entered this case late last week. I just received discovery on Friday. As the court knows, it's very voluminous. And for the record, I wanted to say that, Your Honor, I'm not prepared and would not have been prepared um, to have question any of these witnesses or even the ones that are coming up this week because I've not had enough time. To okay. Have you uh, have you gotten all the discovery in this case, ma'am? Yes, Judge. I was emailed the discovery on Friday. This past Friday? Yes, Judge. Okay. All right. Well. Um, I'll note your objection for the record, madam, and if you require any additional time uh, to be prepared, then... ...and motions of counsel, so... Yes, sure. uh, you should be covered. Yeah, absolutely. But, but you just want to make... I know you want to make sure you object for purposes of your client, uh, Mr. Stevens, and I've no... Morgan Brennan, M O R G A N B R E N N A N. Good afternoon, Ms. Brennan. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Good. Now, can you tell the court what's your occupation? I'm a forensic chemist at the GBI Crime Lab. And how long have you been there? Uh, over three years. Have you held different positions uh, while at the GBA crime lab? I've been a scientist trainee and a crime lab scientist, level two. Okay. And uh, do you have any relevant training or uh, certifications in that area? I have completed the required GBI training um, program that consisted of over a year of training, um, as well as my bachelor's degree in forensic chemistry and general chemistry. Okay. Now, do you have to be uh, certified in that uh, field? No, the bachelor's degree and the training program is sufficient. It's sufficient. Correct. Okay. How do you stay up to date on the material? I am involved in um, continuous training hours required every year, as well as um, yearly proficiency testing. Sorry, quarterly. Not really. And uh, have you qualified, uh, I'm sorry, have you ever been qualified as an expert before? Yes. How many times? Twice. Your Honor, at this time, I move to admit state's proposed exhibit seven. Yeah, first witness. You yeah, may. Ms. Brennan, can you send me a look at that document? That's my CV. And have there been any alterations uh, to that CV? Yes, I recently sent an updated one with my legal name change as well as some um, additional um, training experience that I added to it. 
Uh, Your Honor, if I'm the defense, I'm sorry, the state moves to a new state to propose to get a seven into evidence. Uh, the print previously had provided to any objections to state sevens? No objection, but uh, can I have uh, the young lady's new name? I may have that CV under a different name. I do not have one for Brennan. Yes, uh, former name was Laurie. Uh, new name is Morgan Brennan. All right, having, hearing no other for, uh, objections, state sevens admitted. The witness's former name was Morgan Lowry. Her current name is Morgan Brennan. Ms. Brennan, do you generally test THC? Yes. And how do you test it? Depending on the type of evidence, um, it's always started with weighing and then um, usually gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, um, and followed by HPLC or high performance liquid chromatography if needed. Could you say that one more time? High performance liquid chromatography or HPLC if needed. And is there a rate of ra uh, accuracy when so testing this? For qualitative testing, no. Okay. What does this test typically show if done correctly? Uh, the gas chromatography mass spectrometry GCMS test will show the um, presence or absence of any controlled substances. Okay. And how does this test work? Uh, I would perform the same type of testing. Um, if I performed the high performance liquid chromatography testing, that would be quantitative testing. Um, and that would be comparing my known sample um, or a known reference sample to the unknown case sample. Okay. Uh, and what does this test show if done correctly? The presence or absence of a controlled substance. Okay. And do you test the components of pills? Yes. Yes. Okay. Do you test for methamphetamines? Yes. How do you test them? Typically, I'll, if it's a tablet, I'll visually look at it. If it looks like a pharmaceutical tablet, I'll perform a logo identification. Any shape, size, color, and any imprints to a known reference. Um, and then next, I would follow up with most likely the gas chromatography mass spectrometry. And uh, is there a rate of accuracy for this test? Not for qualitative testing. Okay. How does this test work? Um, I Write any components of a mixture, and the mass spectrometry portion will allow me to uniquely identify. Does this test show if done correctly? The presence or absence of any controlled substance. Material for cocaine? Yes. Um, I will weigh the substance, I'll perform a preliminary test, and then um, in this case, I performed uh, thin layer chromatography, which is a simpler form of the gas chromatography and then follow up with the gas chromatography mass spectrometry.
Um, Your Honor, I'm sure we can we can do it if we can get a couple minutes to get lead counsel here. Okay, all right, okay. Let's go ahead and deal with Mr. Carl. Of course, the motion at this point in time. He's got number one is a motion to compel the state to permit defendant and defense attorney to physical review of state file. Your Honor, that was addressed in the panel of court at a previous hearing. That was about the supposed phone and gun that Mr. Geary was saying was intercepted, and that turned out to actually not even exist. Did he withdraw that motion, sir? No, it was granted by the court, Your Honor. It was just revealed later that what they proffered in court was not true. All right. Number two is a demand for speedy trial. Yes, Judge, I understand the state's response to that, that our speedy trial rights are not currently in effect. That's as well. Due to COVID and other current orders signed by our former Chief Judge Christopher Lincoln. I filed that just out of caution so that I'd make sure it gets in. Well, it's not really right. It's kind of basically a term of art, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. I felt the need to file a district court. Well, depending upon what happens with the speedy trial demands, a couple of weeks or so, it may be pending. All right. Yes, Judge. Number three is a mandatory motion to suppress a March 16th statement. And, Your Honor, those require witness testimony. I proposed those on the 28th. All of our witnesses are available on the 28th. We had them all ready the other day, but we didn't reach them. So if we could have all the evidentiary, just that one and the other March 16th motion on the 28th so we could get all of our witnesses here for that. So that would be the amended motion to suppress, the motion in limine number two. One moment, Your Honor. To exclude the March 16th incident and the alternative to exclude comments of pre-arrest silence. Yes. Okay. And was there another one that's related to that? I believe that's it, Your Honor. I believe those are the three. Thank you, Your Honor. And the next motion, Judge, amended motion to suppress statements of the defendant. That's also going to be on the 28th when the state's witness is available. Yes. Okay. All right. What about the federal criminal special demurs? They cover there's amended special imperial demurs one to count one. There's amended special demur two for court action jurisdiction. There's amended special and general demurs three over action insufficiency. Specificity of data terms. Amended special demurs four unindicted co-conspirators. Amended special and general demurs five insufficient nexus. Amended special demurs. And there's a amended special demur seven with further counts. Yeah, that's all. And I guess relates kind of sort of related to that. There's an amended motion to sever counts. Yes, Your Honor. Now, it's different than this amended motion to sever the trial. The counts are kind of related in that relative. General special demurs and counts. And, Your Honor, Mr. Floyd had written the response to that. I can certainly get through it. But if the court would like to wait for Mr. Floyd to be here, we can get him here on another day. Or I can make my way through it today. When's he? Oh, is he not available today? We hadn't told him to be available today. But I can try to find out when he would be. He said he was available the 28th. But, I mean, I can try to get him here. I'm going to take five and ten minutes. And you can make some phone calls and find out when he's available. But I don't know. I mean, Your Honor, I can, based on his briefs, I should be able to handle the arguments if the court could give me about five minutes to get up to speed. That's certainly more than fair. Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, I'm going to take five and ten minutes. And you can make some phone calls and find out when he's available. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Who's got also a motion to eliminate uh, jail calls? That I'm ready to do right now. Okay. All right. Let's hear that. Okay. We've got jail calls and there's no motion to eliminate. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. You know where the jail calls are? There's another motion to eliminate uh, uh, in regards to other acts. There's a motion to eliminate. I can, yes. Uh, anything in in our omnibus response, I am ready to do right now with no waiting at all. Uh, so that's our the motion in limine, um, the motion limine on the jail calls. Um, Let's take up that right now. Okay. Can you pull? Up? All right. And uh, thank you, Judge. May we approach uh, very briefly about that? Sure. Yes. Um, Your Honor, on two grounds. One, none of the jail calls are probative in any way whatsoever, not even a minutia, to any of the elements of any of the counts uh, for which Mr. Farley is being accused in this indictment. Um, as Your Honor knows, to be, to be relevant, it has to have the tendency to make a fact more or less true, um, but there won't be any fact that the state um, can articulate at that's probative value of, of these calls. I think it's just a... a classic case of tunnel vision where, you know, they want to see the case a certain way and they want to hear it a certain way and they've already defined Mr. Farley in a certain way, but they didn't open their minds to what he was actually saying on the calls and in the state's response to the motion, there's even some just missing, mis, mishearing of the calls. So I look forward to your honor. Calls are, are with various people, his father, um, one is with the mother of his children, his girlfriend, and Your Honor, they, the state tries to say that they're about some kind of tampering or concealing of evidence, and they're just not. Um, and so, Your Honor, they don't have any probative value. Um, and second, even if they do have any kind of slight probative value, the prejudice outweighs that value under Rule 403, um, which can exclude even relevant permissible evidence. One judge, they're extremely prejudicial because they're going to reveal that he was in custody at the time or that he's having to use a jail phone. So that, by definition, lets the jury know that, oh, he's been confined to a jail. Um, so they may draw a conclusion that, oh, he's been denied bond, and then they assume the worst with the bond factors. So that's prejudicial, Your Honor. Um, second, it's just, it's prejudicial in that, um, well, it's also just an, an invasion of privacy, Your Honor, and, and, and not probative. So... You have, you have Uh, there is, Judge. I mean, I have a whole separate motion for that, but I, I don't think that just being just not satisfying an Ayala factor and being held without bond allows the state to <laughs> eavesdrop on intimate conversations. I, I don't think that's constitutional, but it is what it is. That's for a separate motion, Judge. And I will point out the court is correct, but that message on the jail phones never says that those statements might be used against you in court the way a Miranda waiver does. But that's a whole separate um, issue of mine. But the court, the court's correct, Your Honor. I just, it's regardless, they're they're not probative. And any any probative value that the court might see is going to be extremely outweighed by prejudice. Um, for one, Your Honor, the first jail call, I'll just go through them one by one, Your Honor. Um, on the first call, you hear uh, Mr. Farley. Someone says, what's up? He talks about just having woken up. They ask what he's doing, nothing. Then we get to what the state is going to try to say is probative. Someone says... He just talks about being accused, Your Honor. They try to frame this as some kind of confession or acknowledgement or something. It's not. He's talking with the mother of his children about why he's being held in a cage, why he's being confined. He says, they're saying I'm in a gang. They're saying I shot and killed somebody. They're saying I did it for rank. All he's doing is reading the indictment, Your Honor, and he's just explaining to his girlfriend what he's being accused of. So that has no probative value whatsoever. Then... They start talking about, oh, what did they do when I left? Talking about the police. And she responds. She says, they didn't do nothing. They um, came and asked for your phone, but I didn't know. I didn't see no phone. So how is him asking what the police did and her saying they asked for a phone and then him, her saying, oh, I didn't see any kind of phone. I didn't know where it was. What does that have anything to do with whether or not the state is going to meet their burden as far as any of the essential elements of any of the counts, Your Honor. Again, that's just describing what happened. It doesn't have any probative value. 
what else is she to say about just what happened? You know, that sounds like any time you're talking with someone, then it's going to be admissible. And that's just going to waste time, Your Honor. It's not relevant. That's call one, is that what yes, that's, that's call one. And then it goes on. Um, she, there's another part that they may try to mischaracterize. He says, Miles said, get bro for him. As you know, Your Honor, from a prior bond hearing, Mr. Farley is an entrepreneur. He is a clothing maker, a uh, clothing designer. He's talking about get bro for him. What does that mean? I don't know what the state is going to try to say that that means. And then Miles says, yeah, yeah, send those folks down here. That has no probative value. It's not any kind of crime or confession or relevant to any element of any count. And that, as far as that, for the first call, Judge, it's going to then say, he's then going to respond. Um, they're talking about a claim. And then he responds, he says, hey, listen, I'm going to need my Wells Fargo thing so he can go in there and sell this money to you. It's 1200 He's just trying to get control of his finances, Your Honor. What, is, what else is a defendant to do besides arrange for an intimate partner of his to get access to his money so he can start to demonstrate his innocence as he's doing right now, Your Honor? So those, that's jail call one. Again, nothing, nothing probative whatsoever. Jail call two, I don't... Um, the, the speaker on the other line says the police didn't know anything, so... And then Miles says, yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to bring them folks to your house. So again, Your Honor, he's just talking about, although I don't know what the state's going to try to say that is. I'm not trying to bring them folks to your house. That's just intimate conversation, Your Honor. Um, and then he says, yeah, because somebody had to say something. Damn. That's what, the, that's what the person responds. I still, I don't know what that means, Your Honor. I look forward to what the state says is probative about that. Then Miles responds with that, um, what you said they're looking for, the, um, and then she says, yeah, it's in, he says, yeah, it's in the hair box. And they're talking about his phone, Your Honor, because later he's talking about the phone. And Your Honor, I, I, I hate to reveal this in such a public forum, but he is fighting for his life. He's fighting for his freedom. <laughs> What's actually going on in this conversation, Your Honor, is they're rehashing issues of infidelity within their relationship where his intimate partner has suspected him of talking with other women in an intimate way and that there's been a history of her going in his phone looking for stuff like that and it's causing problems it's not anything any person in our society is not familiar with especially younger people it's just a whole thing of people going in their intimate partner's phones so then she he says hey listen do not cut that motherfucker on hey like do not go through that shit don't go through that shit so, Your Honor, he's telling her not to turn it on because he doesn't want her to see what might be in there that's going to cause more drama, cause more conflict within the relationship. They're together. He's, she's the mother of his children. He just says, do not cut that motherfucker on. He's not saying that so that it can get wiped or deleted or tampered with. So, again, how is him telling his girlfriend not to turn his phone on probative in any way uh, but to trash his character and to reveal possible past infidelities to the jury, which is not permissible character evidence at all. And then in the state's response, they try to mislead the court and they say that he says, go throw that out or go throw that. That's not what he says. Your Honor will hear. It says, do not cut that motherfucker on. Like, hey, don't go through. You know what I'm saying? So he doesn't say go throw anything. He says, don't go through that. And then it gets a little inaudible, then jumbled. So he's just telling her, don't turn it on and don't go through it. And then... Of course, that causes um, a bit of conflict later in the call. Um, and that's it. Then she continues to describe what the police were doing at the house, that they were at the window. Um, they are talking about when he was arrested. And then he tells her that they were fitting to come in. And then that's why he woke her up. And she says, you woke me up. I don't even remember. I just remember Destiny screaming. That's his child, screaming as he's being falsely accused and taken away to jail. And so, Your Honor, again, I, I don't, I don't know how him talking about getting arrested and him telling his girlfriend not to look through his phone and not to go through it, not to go throw it like the state um, misinterprets. So, Judge, that's everything for that call, the second call. So, again, no probative value whatsoever, prejudicial, and then extremely prejudicial because it reveals uh, a, ne a supposed negative character trait of Mr. Farley that he's not faithful within his monogamous relationship. That's not fair for the jury to hear at all. Yes, Judge, the second one. Um, the next one, 
Yeah, there, there's four calls, Your Honor. They're five minutes each. Yes, Judge. Yeah, the third call is actually interesting. He's saying, go get the stuff. And she's saying, I need you to go to the house, though. And, um, and she's like, oh, from me? And they're talking about getting some things, and he's talking about getting his gun that's under the bed. And then he says, oh, you can leave that under there. So again, he's, he's actually talking about leaving the gun where it is, and he's just talking about where it is because that's a, a safety issue, Your Honor, of any responsible gun owner not to just leave an abandoned gun while you're you know, wrongfully imprisoned. And so they're talking then about, okay, go get the one, you know, the one, get on that. And then they're talking about, you want me to get that hoodie to your dad, right? He's talking about these hoodies. And if Your Honor remembers, I actually came in at the bond hearing and I held up one of the hoodies because Mr. Farley gave me a hat and three hoodies to have as part of my investigation as I was getting to know him, getting to know the case. And that's what is being talked about on the third jail call. It says, just get him the three, all three of them. And he's not saying what they are exactly because I told him to be discreet about that. Um, but it is what it is, Your Honor. She says, lift up the mattress under the mattress. I've seen it. Yeah, give him that. Give him that. He's talking about me, my investigators. And then he says, you want me to give him the other one like that to him? That's behind the bed. So they're even talking about giving it to him, talking about giving it like that to him. They're talking about the bag. It did smell a bit like tobacco. It was wrinkled up. I still wanted the hoodies, Your Honor. Um, so she says, oh, just the three? He says, yeah, if you have the three, the three. And the, the other, the thing, bro, that I'd be riding with. Okay, that's a gun. But again, Judge, it's not anything about unlawful activity. Again, you would want someone to go get your gun if you were locked up. I own guns. There's one in the console of my car. There's some in my house. If I were to be imprisoned, I would call people to go get those, not leave them abandoned. And there's nothing indicating anything on any of these calls that say that he's trying to conceal evidence or tamper evidence or, or anything, Your Honor. He's not saying get rid of them, hide them from the police. He's just saying go get the gun, leave the one under the bed because my dad knows about it. You'll hear his dad on the call. And then the three the things that he's talking about are those three Make America Slime Again hoodies that he gave to me as part of this case, as part of my investigation, Your Honor. And again, nothing to say that anything is under there. Um, and then, yeah, there's something he says at the end, oh, to the right side, where he's talking about that second gun. To the right side, it's all the way to the right, unless they got it. That's not incriminating. He knows that there might be search warrants, investigation. They might try to take a gun, but he's not saying to hurry up and get it before they get it or anything like that, Judge. He's just saying that's where it should be unless there's been some kind of search and it's been taken, um, which there wasn't. And so she did get it. And that's just responsible gun ownership, Your Honor. So as far as the fourth call, I'll try to see what the supposed probative value of that is. Oh, again, Judge, yes. He's talking about throw all that other shit out the window, man. And when you hear the context of the call, Your Honor, he's not talking about physical items. He's talking about the drama and the relationship that now he's facing the fight of his life, so it's time to throw that shit out the window about other girls and our relationship and that petty type of stuff. That's, that's what he's talking about. And then she talks about, oh, I need you up out of there. We need you to cooperate with them folks. Don't try to, and then she gets cut off. Again, the state's going to try to characterize that his intimate partner urging him to cooperate with the state is somehow what? I don't, I still don't understand, Your Honor. It's actually what they want. It's what they've sought and gotten from other defendants. And so she knows what's going on. She's just, just basically saying, you're not involved in this. Whatever they think it is, you're innocent. So don't try and be tough. And whatever they want to ask you, just cooperate because you haven't done anything wrong. She's not telling him cooperate, confess. She's actually telling him cooperate because you're innocent, not cooperate because you're guilty. Um, and so that's that, Your Honor. Again, he's talking about make sure bro handles that business. Nothing incriminating about that. And then again, more of that type of talk, Your Honor. All this shit out the window, but listen, though, it's 1200 on the card, on the card. When I call you later on, listen, and they start talking about passwords, and then they start talking about uh, passwords to his, to his Instagram account that he uses for business, Your Honor. Um, and that's it. So there's nothing probative at all about uh, the fourth call either. And that all, the fourth call also contains some uh, damaging character evidence in the form of allusions to um, infidelities and just conflict within his relationship, Judge. So I'd, I want the court to actually hear 
the calls, especially that one where he says, don't go through that shit, not go throw that shit. Um, I just want the court to hear all, all four of the calls are only five minutes each. And I'm, I'm prepared to respond to um, any questions the court might have about what even a minutia of probative value exists on any of those calls. Well, Your Honor, uh, if we could, we'd like to play each of the calls and then comment on each one of them, if that would be amenable to the court. Okay. And any objections to the Uh, no, no, no. I, of course the state's going to have to lay the foundation and authenticate them at trial, but I stipulate to them for the purposes of this motion to eliminate. Yes, Your Honor, we're just admitting for the purposes of the motion to eliminate so the court may make a ruling. Okay, yeah. that's fine. All right, sure. All right, so first of the motion, uh, it's admitted. Okay, yeah. thank you, Your Honor. And prior to the calls, I'll just say to the court, relevant, the standard for relevance is extremely low, and simply because Mr. Farley disagrees with the meaning behind the language, um, I think that's going to be an issue for the jury to determine what Mr. Farley is talking about, um, but I think the calls will speak for themselves. So I think we're going to try to play it through our microphone and see if that works for us. All right, you want to try that? Oh, technical difficulties. Windows media player. That's what I'm going to do. Is it possible for everybody to hear that? That's as loud as I can. Is the microphone on? It is, but. Court be willing to consider them uh, in like an in, in camera with myself and Mr. Manettis and Mr. Farley in like a or at the bench. <laughs> um, you have a speaker? I don't have a speaker. I don't even have a speaker in my office, Your Honor. Yeah, uh, you can do it. Do you know, uh, does anybody have the login for that? Uh, yeah, we, that, that was one of the reasons we uh, yeah, I don't think it helps. Oh, are you? Just in case. Just let me know. Thank you. Like right here? And what do I do with it? I'm, I'm very technically challenged, so this is like That's, not going to go. That was half my job when I was in the DA's office, you know. Please. If any, yeah, if anyone can help us, we're going to go faster, but I'm the worst person for this.
quickly send messages to your loved one. E-messaging is now available to help you stay more connected. Do you guys want to hear that? Download the Securus app to sign up. To Thank you. Accept this free call. Press 1 to refuse this free call. Thank you for using Securus. You may start the conversation now. Yeah. What's up? You tell me. What's up? What you doing? Huh? What you doing? It's not picking up. I'm crying my eyes out. Yeah, I'm crying, man. I'm crying. I'm yeah, we're not. It's, there's another voice that should be heard, but it's not. Yeah, it's not here. I can hear it on my computer when I touch on it, but it's not. I've tried that before. <laughs> Incarcerated individual at Fulton County Jail. This call is not private. It will be recorded and may be monitored. If you believe this should be a private call, please hang up and follow facility instructions to register this number as a private number. Waiting to receive a phone call can be hard, but now you can easily and quickly send messages to your loved one. E-messaging is now available to help you stay more connected. Download the Securus app to sign up. To accept this free call, press 1. To refuse this free call, thank you for using Securus. You may start the conversation now. Yeah. Yeah, it is the the, the inmate end. You tell me. Here. What you doing? Huh? What you doing? I can hear it. Yeah, it is very faint around. That's probably how they misunderstood that one part I was talking about. Um, you know, I should have brought a speaker. Uh, we can probably try to get our hands on a speaker. Like a Bluetooth. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I, I, I did not realize how bad the back quality on my computer was. You can try the screen share. It did seem to work on Thursday, if you remember that. <laughs> right, right, right. I, I'm just proposing a screen sharing it the same way. Order the court. Can we, uh, can we just, can we share screen sharing? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Did I give you your thing back? No, I don't. Your Honor, would it be okay if we got Mr. Uh, Minetta's blog into the Zoom? The Zoom won't let me in, and it says, it says I don't have my password, but I don't know what my password is, so I'm sorry.
Oh yeah. I think this might work now, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm playing it now, a judge with it unmuted. I don't think it's playing my computer out here. Yeah, judge, I have, a, I have a portable Bluetooth speaker. I can bring that tomorrow morning. I think somebody's coming with speakers from our office. Thank you. We have, uh, we have someone from our office who's located some speakers that they're going to try to come down with those. I'm sorry about the difficulties. <coughs> Oh yeah, that's, we would have no objection with that as well. I'm sorry, I realized I wasn't in the microphone. Um, Your Honor, the, 
we will not be introducing any 418 or 404 B for Mr. Farley. Um, if we were to bring in any uncharged acts, it would be as intrinsic evidence. And we do have a separate motion regarding intrinsic evidence as to all defendants. <coughs> Your Honor, I guess that goes hand in hand with motion limit A3. I guess there is no other act for them to cross him on at this point. So um, I guess that motion is, is moved. Okay, all right. Your Honor, should, should there be any intrinsic evidence, we would be able to cross it. We would want a ruling that we'd be able to cross-examine him on that evidence if it is admissible. Well, that also, that also Absolutely, Your Honor. Thank you. Oh, uh, yes, Judge. This one is really important. Um, may I proceed on that one? Okay. Yeah, Judge. This one, uh, the the death of Shamel Drinks um, involved an autopsy. Um, that's the count on which Mr. Farley is alleged to. Um, have committed that act, and the the autopsy photos contain a lot of duplicative photos. I, you know, there's there's nothing internal to the body that's relevant in this case, Your Honor. And there's all kinds of autopsy photos. They have his brain turned inside out. They have all kinds of internal organs, um, Your Honor. My experience, judges have excluded those post incision photographs, um, especially in a case where it doesn't involve anything like an overdose or anything about the internal organs at all. It's just gunshot wounds that cause a death. And so, Your Honor, the state is able to show that by the external parts of the autopsy, and the state is especially able to show that by the parts of the autopsy that are done before the examiner begins to make incisions to the body, which just is, is gruesome no matter what the death is. That's just always gruesome and, and prejudicial, Your Honor, and it's not relevant at all in this case to show Mr. Chamel Drink's brain cut up on a table or his eyeballs turned inside out on a table. There's no relevance to that, Your Honor. Um, he's dead, he was shot, that's what this case is about, Your Honor. So anything post-incision, I'm moving to exclude, and also anything duplicative, I would move to exclude, Your Honor. Have you talked to the state about which particular uh, photos they, they seek to admit? Uh, no, Judge, but they did say in their response that they don't have an objection to my asking that we remove photos that include his genitals, because um, that's not relevant, and um, they don't have any objection to that. But outside of that, I haven't had any discussion. We've all been through the written responses. Well, I'm not suggesting you have an objection. I'm saying that the judge didn't give the photos that they're allowing them. Your Honor, I have not heard back from the trial team about that, so I don't know. Um, but, Your Honor, what I do know is that Mr. Farley does use the wrong standard of, uh, for this in his motion. So I would just ask that the court, when reviewing um, any pictures to which Mr. Farley objects, that this court use the correct standard. So Mr. Farley relies on Brown versus State. That's not good law anymore. Um, so we would just ask that this court uh, use the correct standard, which is the standard out of Venturino versus State, and I cite that in my response, um, which is basically a 403 uh, relevant standard as opposed to the Brown standard. The Brown standard said it was those types of photographs were only admissible unless it was necessary to show some material fact, which becomes apparent only because of the autopsy or the incision made by the authorities post indictment incident. Um, that's no longer good law. Now it is basically whether that that evidence is relevant and not um, outweighed by the possibility of 
um, substantial undue prejudice. So that's the new standard. Um, the case law that I think is guiding is the Albury case that I cited in my brief. You all have appeared before us Yes, Your Honor, of course, I will convey to the trial team that Your Honor has requested uh, they identify those photos and hopefully they'll let me know as soon as possible. I'll hold off on that. That's, that's something that you can do prior to where it is it's going to um, the medical examiner in, in the lab. Oh, this is for okay. And Your Honor, we did locate a uh, speaker. Should we have adopted um, relevant motions of other defendants, particularly with the counts that Nichols is also in, so we would adopt it. I understand the court's ruling with regard to the Uh, endeavor to get that information as soon as I possibly oh, can. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's not critical to rule upon right now. It should be ruled upon wherever, wherever the testifying of, you know, either um, Dr. Sullivan or Dr. Hanninger. As long as it's taken care of before then, and certainly, um, certainly for that point in time, it's in the office of the district of Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's that's one of those lyrics motions. A bunch of other defendants have filed them. We would ask that uh, I believe um, we would ask that a day be set for all of those motions or a time be set for all of those motions because I think it's fairly um, a lot of the arguments are very similar. And I would join in that request, Your Honor. Do we have a witness or anybody you know testify about that or, or what? Um, no, I I don't, but I believe. Uh, How long is the music? We have witnesses? Oh, Your Honor, I believe um, I realized Mr. Williams, Mr. Smith reminded me that Mr. Williams does have experts about that, I, I believe, unless I'm wrong. No, that's correct. We, we've, uh, we've filed a motion in regards to that. Uh, the state has uh, filed a response, a supplemental response. We've got um, at yeah, least. Mr. Adam Dunbar, Dunbar. Uh, Mr. Dunbar, as well as um, uh, two other potential witnesses, Andrea Dennis and. Um, those, we filed those um, over the weekend and served the state with them over the weekend. I believe the uh, matter prosecutor has copies of those. Yes. At least two other witnesses that we anticipate. And calls. Mr. Steele asked if he could have them all heard on the 29th, is my understanding. So we would simply ask that any motions be heard after Mr. Mr. Steele and Mr. Williams and Mr. Adams uh, experts are either qualified or disqualified.
Um, yes, those are all motions that Mr. Floyd wrote, but I, I know that the court wants to get those heard, so I can go ahead and um, do that. All right, what about the motion for bond after in-camera inspection of discovery? You want to do that one? I can do it. Yeah, we can, we can do that, Your Honor. All right, so go ahead, Mr. Oh. And, Your Honor, we did actually get a speaker, so. That's one. I have low confidence in your technical. I have low confidence in mine as well, Your Honor. Let's see if we can't get it done. Give that just a little bit. Okay, keep going. All right. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, Judge. Um, Your Honor, I, I don't, I this court has never to this day had a had an actual picture of the nature of these charges as it pertains to Mr. Farley, because what we kept having is proffers that turned out not to be true. Um, Your Honor, I know with Defendant Kitchens, there was some back and forth about this, and, and we got into, well, it's a preponderance standard about how the judge used that. But yeah, it's the difference between it's a free throw, and also federal and state court. It's different in federal court. Right. Uh, Georgia hasn't gone that far. Proffers are acceptable in, 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 in states or uh, criminal cases. Um, it's unfortunately that's just the way that right. uh, our systems, uh, our laws develop in, in terms of that. Oh. So, is there anything more you wish to add to that? Or? Uh, well, yes, Judge. I just I just want to distinguish Mr. Farley from Mr. Kitchens because I was there for that hearing, and I thought it did stand out to me because the proffers that have been made about Mr. Farley that led to a denial of bond the last hearing turned out to just be flatly false in a black and white way where there's no gray area. There's no, there's just no gray area at all. Mr. Geary got up here and said, Your Honor, he tried to hide the phone and he tried to find the hide the gun, but we got him. We got him. And then I do a motion to physically inspect. He stands here to, to Your Honor's face and arranges a physical meeting for me to inspect the gun on the phone. And then 20 minutes later in the hallway, he tells me, oh, actually, we don't have a gun and we don't have a phone. So that whole dramatic allegation against Mr. Farley turned out to be flatly false. There is no gun, there is no phone, and your honor is about to hear those calls. I was, I was ambushed by that, your honor. And so he's talking about jail calls. I don't know what he's talking about. Now I've heard them. They're just flatly not what he said. Your honor is about to hear them. And it's just, there's no preponderance to weigh. It's, was there a phone and a gun seized from Mr. Farley that he attempted to conceal? No. There is not. And he doesn't even have a window tint violation. So he has no criminal record, no arrest record, never even been accused of a crime, presumed innocent here, can't be considered to reoffend because he's never offended before. How can you redo something that you've never done before? When you put re at the beginning of a word, that means do it again. He's never offended. And he hasn't offended here, and he's presumed not to offend it here. So he can't be thought to reoffend. He can't be considered a danger to the community. Your Honor heard from his principal that he'd never even been in a fight at school. So he's never been violent, has no risk of being violent. And then I would assume that Your Honor made the prior ruling based on a risk significant enough under Ayala about tampering. Because um, as far as a flight risk, he's, he's never missed anything. He's never been accused of anything. And he's prepared the way the other defendants were to, to just be at home on an ankle monitor these days, even the legislative notes about bond, Your Honor, say that we have technology that can make at-home detention on the same level as detention in the jail. Um, and so, Your Honor, there wasn't any ruling, I thought, about him being a flight risk, but then it seemed by Mr. Geary's false proffers to the court that that was um, a denial. Uh, also, Judge, I had asked for Your Honor to review in camera um, some of the evidence that the state's talking about, for example, the BP video where they falsely tried to say Mr. Farley went in and <laughs> greeted people at the store, when actually he walks in, sees the people at the cashier, and then purposely doesn't greet them. So again, that's not preponderance. There's no debate about that. He did not greet them in the store. And I wanted Your Honor to see that. I also wanted Your Honor to see some of these music videos where, first of all, I, I think ridiculous to attribute lyrics of art to real life, but even if you do, he's not even mouthing the lyrics in the words. He's a personal assistant to Mr. Wani Lee, the creator of the Persona Slime Life Shorty, and he's there and he's in the videos. Personal assistants are always in the videos. That's a 
it's a hip hop trope, Your Honor, to have a video with you and your friends in your neighborhood. So he's not even saying the lyrics. I wanted Your Honor to see that. And there's even times in the video where he's like on his phone and one E. Lee has to like turn him around and be like, dude, we're, we're, we're filming a video. And so that's what I wanted Your Honor to see because they were characterizing it falsely in their proffers. And so then um, Your Honor said, was that an emotion? I responded, no. So that's why I did uh, refile a motion so that Your Honor. So there's a change in circumstances is what you want me to say. No, Judge, actually, because there's never been a clear view of this situation as it pertains to Mr. Farley. The state, by the way they revealed discovery and mischaracterized it and said proffers that weren't true, robbed the court of all situational awareness to be able to see the nature of the charges as it pertains to Mr. Farley. So I'm not arguing a change in circumstances. I'm arguing that this court has never had a clear view of Mr. Farley as far as the nature of the charges, which is a bond factor, not the merits of the evidence. But the nature of the charges have always been mischaracterized. And when I tried to con correct them, you'll remember Mr. Geary didn't respond to any of that. He didn't respond to any of my comments about the word slime and the fluidity of language and how language is context-based and my ideas about meaning and how they conflict with his ideas about meaning, but he didn't address any of that. He went straight to, well, judge, sure, that's all true, but we got his gun, we got his phone, we heard him telling his girlfriend, trying to get rid of it, but we got it, judge. And that was false. And so, Your Honor, I don't think we need a change in circumstances. There's never been a time where the court got an accurate view of Mr. Farley and the nature of these charges to be able to an analyze this under Ayala um, versus State, which importantly says significant risk, not just risk. And so, Your Honor, I don't think that the court's ever been in a position without an in-camera inspection of some of the evidence and without knowing now that what Mr. Geary said on the news directly to the camera was just not true. And now that's out there. So I want that out there that that wasn't true. And so Your Honor made a ruling based on things that weren't true. So we shouldn't need a change in circumstance. The only change in circumstance is that this is the first fair and transparent and honest bond hearing that Mr. Farley is going to have in this case. And I do want Your Honor to, to post a bond, to grant a bond, just in case we don't start on January 9th, Your Honor. Um, and so we're willing to submit to any conditions, any kind of house arrest, any kind of reporting, any kind of ban from social media, technology. Um, I mean, he can, he can run his business through his, his assistance. He doesn't even need to have a phone, Judge. He cannot have a phone and just sit in the house and report however Your Honor wants him to report and tie an ankle monitor wherever we want to tie it, it doesn't matter. But he'll be monitored 24 seven. And um, he's, not a, he's not a risk on any of the bond factors, let alone a significant risk. And that's been acknowledged apart from that last proffer by Mr. Geary at the last hearing that was just not true. And Your Honor is going to also hear these jail calls that were Mr. Geary's response to my proffers mm -hmm. and they're also not the way he said. And so, Judge, I just asked for a reasonable bond to this particular defendant um, in the amount of $50,000. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, anyone else here want to say anything? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, Your Honor, well, first of all, oh. oh. Uh, I think your thing's still here. Okay. Um, Your Honor, first of all, uh, can everybody hear me? Um, as to the... Yes, uh, I think we were transparent with the court before that Mr. Geary got the facts wrong. That happened. However, here's what he didn't get wrong. Um, the jail calls are, I know Mr. Mineta, so I respect him as, you know, what he's saying, but the jail calls are patently different than what he's saying. It's clear based off these jail calls, the only reason we did not actually find the phone and did not actually find the gun were because Mr. Farley arranged to ensure that we never found those items due to uh, ensuring the phone was disposed of, that one of the guns was taken to Farley's family members. Um, that's really clear from the jail calls. Um, and so that's first of all. So not just, uh, not just, uh, I don't believe the court needs to actually hear the jail calls to make. I just wanted to rebut that first of all. Second of all, your honor, um, Farley is currently facing murder charges for the murder of Mr. Drinks. He was incarcerated for Mr. Drinks' murder prior to this indictment. That was a brutal murder by gang members of a, in a rival in a gang dispute, essentially. Um, he, Farley was seen at a gas station immediately before the murder. Um, he was wearing YSL apparel with the 
uh, poured slime on them. Um, he was with his co-defendants that murder at the gas station. That's like immediately before the shooting. Um, additionally, evidence shows that Farley was at a essentially a YSL trap house, like a house where they commit unlawful activities uh, within about 48 hours after that shooting. It was so recent this shooting that one of the co-defendants actually was still wearing the same clothes as during the murder. Um, the state also has uh, evidence that shows that Farley has some access to a cell phone while he's within the Fulton County Jail. And I attach this to our motion as State's Exhibit A, if the court would, uh, has a copy of my omnibus motion I filed. Um, it's attached to State's Exhibit A. Um, it was located on as recently as December 3rd of 2022. It was posted on an Instagram account that was named YSL.rude, and it showed a picture of Farley that appears to be, um, I don't know the legal term for it, but a selfie. It's where he's holding a camera and he's taking a picture of himself while displaying a middle finger. It, it appears that that photo was taken in the Fulton County Jail. Um, whoever created this post, uh, presumably a YSL associate or sympathizer, posted this selfie of Farley with the comment, free the creator of Massa. Um, I think as Mr. Minnes agree, Massa is the clothing line associated with YSL. Um, it means the YSL slogan, make America slime again. Um, additionally, Farley's jail calls show that he has communicated with co-defendants through third parties. For example, he'd call a girlfriend of a co-defendant, they'd contact with that co-defendant. So for the reasons stated above, um, and additionally, because the nature of this charge is a murder charge, um, in addition to all these gang charges, he was a participant in a very serious homicide, a shooting of a young man um, only less than a year ago, we would ask that this court deny bond, but certainly we also would hope that the court will consider the jail calls as well, because I think that truly solidifies why Mr. Farley cannot hold, have a bond. But additionally, Your Honor, there's been no change in circumstances, although the only difference between what Mr. Geary, he believes that the, the gun and the phone had been recovered, that was the only error. Other than that, everything he said was accurate and the jail calls do reflect that Farley attempted to hide these items. He is charged for murder. And again, it does look like whether or not he currently has a cell phone in his possession, that photo being posted so recently of a selfie, it's not a picture that someone took of him. It's clearly that he took of himself while giving a middle finger. It's attached as exhibit A in the jail. Um, would support the denial of bond, Your Honor. Just the mere fact of facing a murder charge doesn't make you a bond risk. Otherwise, everyone that's presumed innocent and accused of murder wouldn't get a bond. And again, Judge, it's not YSL apparel. That's the part that Don Geary left unanswered last time. I don't want to get the state any ideas, but on the Make America Slime Again Instagram account, Mr. Williams is not the only one wearing the clothing. And Make America Slime Again has nothing to do with YSL explicitly. There is also artists like Future and T.I. on the Instagram wearing the same hat at Mr. Williams and that same shirt that Mr. Farley is wearing on the BP video, Your Honor. And the shirt says slime or die. It's just a play on words like trap or die. Your Honor, um, again, the state still by their proffer in a black and white way has failed to articulate any party to any crime. If you listen carefully to what Ms. Rosenwasser just said, all she talked about was presence and association. He's at the BP. He's with these people afterwards. He's wearing a shirt that has the word slime on it. Your Honor, Make America Slime Again is an LLC. It's an official company. It has nothing to do with just YSL. It was Mr. Farley's attempt to get any proximity to any artist of any kind of attention when attention is such a commodity these days, especially for the clothing business. And if you notice, too, the, the shirts that Mr. Wani Lee is wearing in his videos, because Mr. Farley and him are close friends from since they can even remember, and he is his personal assistant paid by Alamo Records in an official way, Mr. Wani Lee is also wearing shirts from a different clothing line. I think it was a true detail or something like that, and it's some relative or other person that he's trying to put on. So, Your Honor, this is not YSL apparel. This is a person, an entrepreneur, who is close to Wani Lee, has a business relationship with him, and then networks with musicians and other types of people to make his clothing more visible. 
And so, Your Honor, again, there's just presence, there's just association, and as far as access to a phone, that doesn't show anything. It shows that he's on the phone in the jail, but it doesn't mean that it was his phone, it doesn't mean that he posted it, that account that did the story wasn't him. You can reshare stories, you can post stories of other people. So just like when we had that proffer about Mr. Kitchens where someone said, oh, I'll, I'll do anything for Gunna, if someone wants to post something with an image that they somehow got because a camera from a jail phone was on Mr. Farley for a second and took a picture of him giving the middle finger, okay, he didn't decide to post that. He didn't decide to someone say free him or anything like that, Your Honor. So again, I, I don't see how being in a phone image makes you a, a risk on any of the bond factors, Judge. Uh, well, I'll listen to the uh, Okay. Uh, I believe so. I think we, we just tested it. It's got to we'll find out. All right. Okay. So, okay. so this is the jail calls. This is number one, and I'd like to just be able to respond after each one. Right, that's fine. Let's play jail call number one for the Okay. The free call from an incarcerated individual at Fulton County Jail. This call is not private. It will be recorded and may be monitored. If you believe this should be a private call, please hang up and follow facility instructions to register this number as a private number. Waiting to receive a phone call can be hard, but now you can easily and quickly send messages to your loved one. E-messaging is now available to help you stay more connected. Download the Securus app to sign up. To accept this free call, press 1. To refuse this free call, thank you for using Securus. You may start the conversation now. Hello. Yeah. What's up? You tell me. What you doing? Right. Huh? What you doing? Crying my eyes out. You ain't got to cry, man. It's all right. You both come out. I done shot and killed somebody, man. What? Yeah, they don't just say on the side. They say accuse. They say I'm the one who's in the world. I don't know. This shit is crap. What? Yeah, okay. What the fuck? I can't. I'm huh? What? They killed somebody. What they, what they do when I left? They, they didn't do nothing. They, um, came and asked for your phone, but I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't see no phone. Yeah. Did you know that? You still got that number I gave you? Um. You had I call my dad? Yeah. What do you say? He said he called a lawyer with lawyer. He said keep him up there. I need you to get 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 Bob on him, man. So I got that. No, it look matter of fact. Call um uh, call call Lexi, baby, there. If you want that. Call him and say what? I was just talking to her. Call him and say what? Yeah, tell him. Got down hit breakfast. He know what I'm talking about. Say just say my says. Get broke for him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no folks down here. Okay. These folks trying to goddamn murder, gang charges, and like they saying I'm I'm trying to like get get more ranking in the gang. That's why I, I guess 
it's wild. The shit I did, whatever the shit they accused me of, he's like, it's for initiation, like a higher rank in the game. Like, I'm. That shit. That's yeah, it. it's tripping. Yeah, but that's why you just need to cooperate and do what you got to do to get on the body because you have a son. Yeah. So you can't be thinking about nobody else or what nobody else got going on. You got to think about you because nobody give a fuck about you but you. You can't be yeah. thinking about what them folks going I ain't trying to say, you know, but. Yeah. You just need to start. You just need to think about him, day. That's all I'm saying. Think about him. Stop. And yourself, but you can't be in there. What you crying for that? Huh? Why are you crying? Why are you crying? I'm not crying. I'm not crying. I'm not crying. I'm not crying no more. I need you to get that number from me, bro. <laughs> you want you want you act like you want me to call on three way or something? Nah, hell no. Nah. Hell no. Nah. Okay, I mean, but how would you get the note like call, call, huh? call, call, call on three way? Um this one I'm getting on. Oh wait, let me get my home. No, her number says I could just add the car. What is it doing? Right here. Hold on, I'm calling. You heard what I told you, what I said before I left? Huh? Ah. Answer. But I was just talking to her literally like right before you called. You she have one minute left. I said you heard what I told you oh. before I left. What you say? No, I didn't hear you tell me nothing. I love you too, man. Don't, be, don't let me fuck you down, bro. Stop crying. Stop. No, I was going to count on my claim, but I'm going to keep doing it. Hey, yeah. hey, listen, I'm going to be my, my way of cargo thing so he can go in there and zero this money to you. It's 1200 it, I gotta give you the log in, you know what I'm saying? So you can live. What? You didn't money. ever get that money? Yeah, I'm just. So when you gonna give him the log in? I'm gonna give it to you. I gotta call, I'm gonna hang up and call it. Oh, so you can call it. I'm thinking you ain't finna call it. I'm saying, he said I can give you the phone, though. They said I got caught tomorrow at 12. I know, that's who I, before, right before you called, that's who I was trying to get on the phone with to get the link, he said. To get the link? Because I got all the stuff on the link, the Zoom link. That's what. Thank you for using Securus. Goodbye. So, Your Honor, that's call number one. That call is relevant because of the context of the other calls. So, what is notable about that call is, first of all, he discussed his charges. So, I think that's always going to be relevant. And of course, the relevancy standard is really, really low. The question is whether this is in any way relevant, and it is. It's not. You know, the only evidence by any means that we have against him, it wouldn't be enough to convict him on that call alone, but it's relevant. What's particularly important here is that in this call, um, the called party says, tells Farley that law enforcement came and asked for your phone, but I didn't see no phone to give nobody. So that goes into the next few calls we're going to hear. It essentially sets the scene for the remaining three calls. So if the court would uh, allow us to play the second call now. Okay. All right. Call from? Wow. An incarcerated individual at Fulton County Jail. This call is not private. It will be recorded and may be monitored. If you believe this should be a private call, please hang up and follow facility instructions to register this number as a private number. Waiting to receive a phone call can be hard, but now you can easily and quickly send messages to your loved one. E-messaging is now available to help you stay more connected. Download the Securus app to sign up. To accept this free call, press 1. To refuse this free call, thank you for using Securus. You may start the conversation now. Hello. Mm -hmm. Hello. When I call, they hit one 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 one. So many times, you ain't got to go through while they're going to straight accept the call. Okay. But goddamn, this shit crazy, bro. Mm, yeah. 
You folks did tripping. You don't even know how to change for the dope drugs on. You don't even put on my goddamn mouth. I mean, I'm saying. Yeah. Nah, bro. Yeah. I can't hear you. I said, you know what's up, though? Like, you did it. Yeah, but. Shit, cap it hell, man. I know, but. Well, At least you know anything coming back. I'll be bringing them from your house. Yeah, I don't want them with you. How the hell they get that address? Oh, I don't even know. Like, I don't know. Yeah, cause somebody else, somebody had to say something. Damn. But goddamn, get what? That, 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 um, that, um, well, you said they were looking for, for the, um, it's in the, um, uh, hair box. Huh? It's in the hair box. So, Your Honor, I've paused it there, uh, if the court could hear. Farley said, so what they were looking for, it's in the hair box. That refers back to the call. And I do want to be clear that these four calls are all in the same day over a very short period of time. Um, so he just said, so what they were looking for, it's in the hair box. And um, we'll continue the call. I just wanted to flag that to the court. Hair box. Hair box? Hair box. Oh. Yeah, listen. Do not cut that motherfucker on me. Like, go throw that motherfucker. Like, you see what I'm saying? What? And so, Your Honor, that's where the defendant said, do not cut that, um, go throw that. And that is, uh, obviously, Mr. Farley's contention was that that was because he believes it contains unsavorable, unsavory character evidence. I believe that the jury could interpret it as the state has, which is that the phone would be evidence that the police were seeking. So we'll continue with the call. Why you? Okay, ma'am. Wait, wait, uh, yeah, you got to you ain't hit on four outside. You know what they were saying? They was at the window and shit, I heard them. Like, I ain't really want to get no sleep, though, but. You heard what they were saying? They were like, we finna come in, shit, that way I woke you up. You woke me up? I don't even remember. I just remember this and screaming. I, I had no crowd, MJ. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, that shit crazy, bro. Mm -hmm. That shit is lame. What the fuck? I'm saying, though, and I, it, I ain't finna keep going through this shit with you, though, bro. Like, yeah, no. I got a little question. Yeah, that's man. I'm smiling all that back and forth shit. What we be going through? Like, that's you, bro. Like, you really with a nigga, though, but, you know. He got less. You want me to answer? Yeah, hurry up and answer right quick. Let's go. My phone is on. Yo. Oh, hold on. Let me give you the phone. I love you. I think you're on. What's up, Donna? I think you're finna hang up to me, sir. Yeah. Yo, my boy. What's up, bro? I let, I let them folks, baby. Them, them uh, I'm, yeah. uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, right on there right now. I just talked to them. Uh, my boss said they're gonna call back when they wake up. But, All right. uh, he just told me. Alright. You good? Yeah, G. Well, here they come out. They say, I got down. I shot and killed them. Out. Then they say, gang charged and got down. Um, initiated to get ranked. Like, I'm trying to do the shit for rank. You have one minute left. That's it. So, that's it. Sound so down and goofy, man. Man, what? But, you know how that let's shit see, I'm all, I'm all right on that shit, though. I'm finna be on bro ass, though, but it, it more definitely go, though. See, I think I wait till they wake up. All right. Hey, let me call you. I didn't like him. Play I love him. Yeah. If I don't finna call you. I don't know, I ain't to. I'm finna call no, you right okay. there. Oh, okay. Alright. The caller has hung up. Okay, uh, Your Honor, we'll move on.
move on to call three. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Call from? Yeah, Jay. An incarcerated individual at Fulton County Jail. This call is not private. It will be recorded and may be monitored. If you believe this should be a private call, please hang up and follow facility instructions to register this number as a private number. To accept, thank you for using Securus. You may start the conversation now. Hey. Hey. You hear me? Yeah. Hello? I hear you, yeah. Can you hear me? Call my dad right quick. Okay. Damn, this shit lying me here, man. Oh. Yeah, right street. Yeah. Which number, man? Seven, seven, oh, or yeah, oh. call that one. Call that one. <clears throat> e for hello. <laughs> Yo. Hey, uh -huh. Yo, what, what, hey. Yeah. What, what, what? Yeah. What number you at? The shop. You busy? You got somebody in the shop? Yeah. All right. Now, I'm going to say go by the house right quick. Who house? You know what house? Oh, uh, okay. But, uh, uh, what name, uh, say you're going to come down now? Uh, I'm G. what they saying? They somebody, I, I, I shot and killed somebody. Then they say the game charges, then they say the reason I did it was to get ranked. Ranking initiated or something. Oh. So, what is that? Yeah, you know that cap. I ain't did none of that. Buddy. So, where you at? All right, I'm down here. I got a court tomorrow at 12. Okay. But I need, I need, I need you to go to the hollow and, um, okay. and, and, um, get, get that stuff. From me, man? Yes. Huh? Yes. Okay. So, that, my, my gun on the bed, though, you can leave that on there. Yeah. Mm. So, Your Honor, at that point, um, I'm sure the court heard Mr. Farley ask the, it, it sounds like a, another person that he had the call party call and instructs that person that he needs to go to the house and get some stuff. And then he specifies my gun under the bed. So, I want to relate that back to the bond motion. Here we are talking about covering up the cell phone and covering up the gun. So, that's exactly what what happened based on those calls. Um, and obviously that's relevant also going to the jail call motion. And we'll, we'll keep going. Okay, but it's, all right. Right, all right. Look, no. Hey, listen. No, no. You know, you know um, the one, you know the one? Uh -huh. Yeah, get, get him, get him that. Okay. What you finna hang up on? Huh? You don't want to talk no more? No, what are you talking about? Oh, I mean, I, I just said, okay, I got you. Like, what, what else you want me to say? I'm really trying to process what you were saying. What you, were saying. Like, <laughs> you know, you just said what they, what, what, what they want, right? Huh? Remember what you said, what they, what they wanted? Yeah. Your Honor, again, that's where he referenced uh, what they wanted. That goes back to the first call. That's how that first call becomes relevant. He's instructing the caller about what to do with what they wanted. Yeah. I just told you. I know, man. Yeah. What's down, bro? You good? Got down. Um, you want me to give that hoodie to your dad? Uh, what? Nah, that yeah, 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 yeah. That ain't no, that ain't that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just get him. Them three, them three, all three on. Uh, okay, that's what I'm talking about. 
Yeah, all three on. Really got down. And so he. <laughs> I ain't tripping about none of the other stuff though, cause I'm so in that in that in that in that in that other one in that in that other one. You know, it's it. You say a wet mouth. You lift up the mattress, it's under the mattress. You have one minute left. I seen it. I seen it. Yeah, get him. You want me to give the other one like that to him? This behind the bed? Nah, hell no. Nah. Or just the three, what you call it? <laughs> yeah, get him the three. The, the three. Yeah, okay. And that's it? And the and the and the and the, and the other one, that that thing, bro, that I be that I be riding with. Mm -hmm. You remember the one I gave okay. you? Okay. You remember the one I gave Your Honor, uh, the defendant just instructed the called party to give him the three, not the one under the bed. I think from context clues that would suggest, or at least have enough probative value to suggest that there are three other items, perhaps guns. He also references not the one I've been riding around with. Again. Oh, uh, yeah. Keep that. What, the other one? You, you never gave it back. It's, I'm telling you, you can keep it. It's under the it's under the thing. Oh, so that's the one that's under the the mattress? Yeah, it should be two on the It's one. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Go to the right side. It's all at the right. Unless they got it. You can't call back in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless they got it. It's all at the right. Oh, oh. It's, well, oh, I didn't see that. Thank you for using. So which one secure us? Goodbye. This is a free call from an incarcerated individual at Fulton County Jail. This call is not private. It will be recorded and may be monitored. If you believe this should be a private call, please hang up and follow facility instructions to register this number as a private number. To accept, thank you for using Securus. You may start the conversation now. Yeah, just get, Hello. He just said I got. He got. I got. I got. Wrap it up. I got one minute left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you can take take some, what we gonna do the hair? You know what I'm saying? What? I'm gonna call you. If I can do what now? If you can take it up, that's wrong. You feel what I'm saying? Before you go do hair, like on your on your way to do hair. I want you. You go to watch. We 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 go which is that he asked uh, the called party to take it up there to him on her way to go do hair. And, um, Your Honor, we'll stop there. We know that uh, the court's heard a lot of these. The court's, we're welcome to play the rest of it if you would like to hear it. I'm, I'm good. Okay. Um, and so, at the court's pleasure, I do have argument on those calls that we heard. All right, okay. Well, go ahead. Let's see your argument. Okay. Start out with call number one. Your Honor, so what's important here, and this is going, I'll go first with the motion in limine, and then I'll reference it back to the bond hearing. Uh, as to the motion in limine, each of these calls is relevant when considered in context with the other calls. So call one is when the called party references the fact that uh, basically people came to the house looking for something. Then in the following calls, it details Farley's attempts to hide the item that the officers came looking for. And I think Farley seems to even concede that the item that they were looking for is a phone because he says, you know, don't turn it on, go throw it away, essentially get rid of it. And he now contends that that's because he was having, you know, outside relationships, but we don't know that. And the jury doesn't know that. That's a, that's a matter of interpretation. It's enough to be relevant, and he can argue at trial what he argued here. That's a perfectly acceptable argument, but nevertheless, it doesn't make it not relevant. I think that leads us into two. It's just where he says all that, and he says it's in the hair box, and he says where to find it, and says not to turn it on. So I think that's, that's enough to be relevant. Relevance is an extremely low bar, Your Honor, and that is enough to be relevant. And there's nothing prejudicial about it. He never says, don't turn the phone on because I'm cheating on you. He just says, don't turn the phone on. It doesn't go into any kind of extramarital affairs or anything like that. 
he's welcome to interpret that however he'd like to, as is the jury, but it's relevant. It's nevertheless relevant to show that he is in the state's contention and based off the recording itself, clearly trying to hide something that they, quote unquote, came looking for. As to the third call, I think this is the one that essentially is why the other calls are all relevant and goes into this third call. In the third call, this is when Farley instructs the called party to give, quote unquote, what they wanted to Farley's father. Um, and another caller then joins the call. Farley discusses the case. And then he instructs the third part person added to the call to go to the house and get the stuff. Farley references a gun under his bed. Farley also tells the called party, you know the one, give him that. He repeatedly references what they wanted. And then he references giving all three items to his father. Farley instructs the called party to look under the mattress, explaining the one she can keep is under the mattress. That goes back to the gun. Um, Farley also references the phrase is the one I be riding with and sh he says that the item is all the way at the right unless they got it. So he's clearly giving instructions to an item. It would suggest from context clues that that is a gun. Call two obviously concerns the phone. We have suggested from context clues that that's what it means. Finally in the fourth call, Farley instructs the called party to take the item up there to him that is to another location. Considered together, this shows that Farley made efforts to hide evidence or items for which law enforcement came to the house looking. The relevant standard on her is very low. This is enough to be relevant evidence. It shows that Farley is trying to hide something, arguably a cell phone and a gun. That's what it suggests, at least to my listening of it. And I believe it could certainly suggest that to a jury. Um, I think, I also think his discussion of the case itself is relevant. Um, obviously, in the first call, the called party, you know, suggests that he cooperate with law enforcement. I think that's all relevant. So first of all, Your Honor, we'd ask that this court deny Farley's motion in limine. As to the bond, um, it goes back to what I said before. For all the reasons that I stated previously, um, including that Farley clearly, as Mr. Mineta, we, we aren't saying he personally is owning a phone right now, but he clearly had access to a phone in the jail based on that photograph. Additionally, Your Honor, he's charged with murder. That is a very serious charge. He was charged with that before he even got these additional RICO charges and the charges in this indictment. Your Honor, and I, this goes back, I'm sorry, back to point one, he's charged with murder. That was a homicide involving a shooting. So I think the existence of a gun is going to be even more relevant to that. But back to the bond, Your Honor, this is extremely relevant information. The state never lied about the contents of the jail calls. The court just heard them. I think it's clear from the jail calls that Farley did try to hide a phone and a gun from the authorities because he asked if they even referenced if the cops, if they didn't get it when they were there. That was even a reference in there. So I think, Your Honor, that this court properly denied Mr. Farley bond. My understanding is that this case is going to trial within the next two to three weeks. Um, and so we'd ask that this court continue to deny him bond and to also deny his motion in limine. Thank you. Okay. Um, as for the motion in limine as it relates to the jail calls, the court does find that um, <coughs> calls one, two, three, and four are in fact um, <coughs> probative and relevant, and especially in regards to the potential evidentiary value of what the state of Andrews at trial and the conversations and context that, uh, that may be relevant. Um, also related to the phone and the gun, there is some evidence to believe that, uh, that this uh, phone and gun tried to be attempted to be, to be hidden or secreted from the, uh, from the authorities. I do believe that Ms. Rosenwald has indicated that it would uh, be relevant for the purposes of bond, and for that reason, I'm going to deny bond. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, may we have a written order on the... Yeah, if you prepare a suitable order on both those matters right now. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, you can show that to Mr. Menez, and we'll go ahead and prepare that. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Just one note with regard to... to this evidence, you admitted it, but you admitted it against Mr. Farley. This doesn't resolve 
the 801 D2E issues with regard to everybody else. So I want to make sure that, well, it's got 801 D2E issues. We've got Bruton issues. If his jail call comes in <coughs> post arrest with regard to everybody else in count one, and I do not want to acquiesce to that. And Your Honor, we do have a separate 801 D2E motion. So I think that could be addressed at another time. And um, that's, that's correct. I just want to make sure that that's that with regard to these particular post arrest statements of a co defendant, we've got several substantive issues before they can come into trial, not just against him. On behalf of Mr. Stillwell, um, yeah, I join I'm, in Mr. Oh, Harvey's. Mr. Harvey, and yes. Mr. Uh, I would ask that you more or less Mr. Harvey, that I can go ahead and have that. I have. I filed an 801 D2E, and I think there are there are there so are you, motions you're pending. Adopted, you'll need to file some particularized motion. I did. Not not you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, the uh, other um, strap hangers, Mr. Harvey. Okay, that have uh, yeah, that adopted your motion need to particularize their own motion because it depends upon what it says to me as to whether or not it's admissible or not. Right. So name is a proven issue. Whatever. We need to identify the statement. I have filed such motions, but not towards this well, particular I, I, state. Look, a lot of folks just particularize because a lot of times that's what we usually have. The court has to kind of look at each statement by itself as it relates to um, that particular defendant. You're, you're entirely correct. Let, let's, let's, as far as it goes, <laughs> however, <laughs> your lordship. But um, <laughs> let's let's flip that a little bit. Um, um, I, we filed a motion saying, "Hey, look, what 801 D2E potential statements or statements of co-defendants are you going to use?" So that we file a motion in limine, but you got to tell us what you're going to use, like this one. So we can't particularize this whole mass of statements. Yeah, Mr. Wilson, you're going to need to kind there of you parse Thank out you. and do a little homework, whatever it is you decide to sit down and talk in this decision, because it will affect the decision. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Your Honor, as we stated in our motion, uh, we would just ask that they let us know what they're objecting to so we can respond to it. But, okay, Mr. Harvey's saying that you need to identify what statements you're going to, you know, you're going to, like, for example, if you're going to introduce statements against, you know, involving defendant A, you need to go ahead and let them know you're going you're gonna to do that. Why is that important? Because if defendant C says, well, you know, that implicates me, um, then I need to be able to respond to it. Um, Your Honor, we provide all the statements we have in discovery. Um, I think generally because it's a RICO, everything's going to apply to everyone. Um, so I, if they could just object, it's going to be a lot easier for me to be able to prepare a response because I, like, generally our position is that all the co-conspirator statements, they are going to be admissible against everyone. So that's... that's yeah, yeah, given, given the type of case, but to the extent that you can, and it will affect because... Um, then you certainly, I would certainly advise you. You know, a blanket statement that every statement everybody ever made since 2013 is a co-conspirator statement is, is blatantly overbought. For example, this post-arrest statement from Gail telling someone else to do allegedly something, and I don't know how he's going to explain it, but if that comes in, that's not a co-conspirator statement. I don't believe and we'll argue that. But we need to have it identified. You know, everybody has talked to everybody for the eight years. Well, you see, Mr. Harvey, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's part of the state's, I guess, uh, with the RICO statute and its uh, applicability, that's one of the most powerful aspects of the statute. Bingo, but it doesn't trump the 801 D2E exclusion. It's they've got to show it's in the course of, in furtherance of the alleged conspiracy. 
So there's, there's, there are more hurdles than just saying, yo, it's a conspiracy. Everything everybody says comes in. And Even Mr. Botts knows that. Governor, we have a full motion on well, that. He's not saying CLEs. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> along with you, so, so that may be a problem. I'm working on it. And, and, and Your Honor, I, I would just like to say on behalf of Mr. Stilwell that we do believe that the ball is in the state's court. And if they're the ones that decided to indict this case this way, if they want to try Mr. Stilwell by himself, we all these problems will be solved. But they have decided to put 28 people together, and um, it's very difficult to determine what statements by the other 27 people will be attempted uh, they'll attempt to implicate Mr. Stelwell with. And I think I speak for probably the rest of the defendants in that sentiment as well. I think Mr. Harvey said, uh, unless, unless you opted out, I'm going to assume it is that, that that'll apply to the rest of you. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. And Bless you. Thank you, Judge. All right. We have Mr. Floyd here, Your Honor, for the murder. I, I see him. Okay. All right. So, uh, but but to your to the aspect of that, Miss uh, Miss Rosenwasch, you will have to kind of distinguish out uh, or those particular statements. I would tend to agree with Mr. Harvey about that. You're going to have to distinguish the D, the 801 uh, D, or E issues, okay? Yes, Your Honor. I'll communicate that request to the trial team and get that information to everyone as soon as I can. Yeah. So, I mean, it just makes, it'll just make things a, little, a lot easier. Absolutely, but, Your Honor. Okay? All right. Uh, and you'll prepare an order denying the, uh, the issues in, as it relates to the motions in limiting to the jail calls as well as to the bond, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, wonderful. All right, okay. Um, Mr. Floyd, good to see you, sir. Yes, Your Honor, good to see you. Okay, um, we have um, we have an we have an amended special and general demur one, as re this relates to Mr. Farley, to dismiss count one. There's an amended special and general demurs two, overt action jurisdiction. Three is a, is pertains to overt acts and insufficient specificity of vague terms. Four is unindicted co-conspirators. Five is insufficient nexus. Six is distinguishing between overt and predicate acts. Uh, seven is um, duplicative counts, and then related to that would be an amended motion to motion to sever an amended motion to sever, and then um, the. Uh, I made a motion to sever his trial. Yeah, there's also one to dismiss the RICO count. Um, yeah. Are you ready on that? If yes, to dismiss the RICO count. Yes. Uh, is that the um, constitutionality? Is that the, yeah, the constitutionality of it? Of, yes. Can yeah, if you could deal with those, sir, that would be wonderful. Okay. Um, Mr. Menez, do you wish to have any further argument on it, or do you want to submit, stand on your brief, and I can let Mr. Floyd uh, respond, or? I want a little bit of argument, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Go right ahead. Thank you, Judge. Go ahead, sir. So the first one, Your Honor, is, is a general demure. And so, as the court knows, uh, a defendant can generally demur if they could admit the facts in the indictment but not be guilty of the crime charged. But the way that the state has uniquely indicted this case leaves it open uh, to an interpretation where Mr. Farley would not be guilty of count one because they won't have satisfied the element of having a pattern of racketeering, which is at least two acts of racketeering. So, Your Honor, the way this all really gets started is the state has put the indictment in three parts. They have part one where they talk about the conspiracy. And what's interesting here, Your Honor, is they list, and I don't know if Your Honor has the indictment. I do, sir. You do? Okay. They list out after, in part one, they list these bullet points where they essentially list in all the possible ways they can commit racketeering activity. But 
Your Honor, what's very interesting is if you look at the last two sentences of that paragraph, part one, it says, in furtherance of the conspiracy, the defendants engaged in the activities enumerated herein. But it does not say what they mean by enumerated herein. And in Black's Law Dictionary, it even says that the word herein is inherently ambiguous. It can mean anything here in this document. And Your Honor, they later in part three, after describing the enterprise in part two, they part three say acts in furtherance of the conspiracy. So the interpretation that I submit to the court is that when they say in furtherance of the conspiracy, the defendants engaged in the activities enumerated herein, under one general demure interpretation, which of course is not the way that the state intended to write it, but it's a way that they left it open to interpretation, that herein means the acts in part three. Because the sentence right after that says the objectives of the conspiracy included, but were not limited to, and then it has a colon, and we can assume that the colon refers to the bullet points. But that way, we can interpret that the bullet points are there only to articulate the objectives of the conspiracy, not as any predicate acts or acts of racketeering. So when they say herein, they could be referring to just part three. And Your Honor, in the one through, however many it is, one through 91 overt acts, Mr. Farley is only alleged to be part of a few of those, numbered 95, 103, 110, 120, 132, 141, 173, and 176. And then also very interesting, Your Honor, that first paragraph of part three, it says, in furtherance of the conspiracy and to the effect its objectives and purposes, the defendants committed and caused to be committed, among others, the following overt acts, certain of which, certain of which constitute acts of racketeering activity. So they've left open this ambiguity that of these one through 191 things, they're overt acts, all of them, but certain of them are acts of racketeering. So then, Your Honor, under my interpretation as a general demure, you can look at each one of those acts and see that only two of them actually articulate criminal behavior. Because 95 talks about lyrics of a video that he's not even rapping in. Um, 103 talks about a video that he appears in, not criminal activity. 110, again, talks about a video with some lyrics. 120 talks about him posing on a social media with clothing that has the word slime on it. Again, not criminal, not an act of racketeering. 132, engaging in a conversation. Again, Judge, that's not an act of racketeering activity to engage in a conversation, although that's the one where uh, Mr. Williams is alleged to have made some kind of comment. Um, 141, they talk about him having a tattoo that says ESPN, every slime plays nasty, or rock crew, LaRay's on Cleveland. Again, Your Honor, having tattoos is not an act of racketeering. 173 and 176, though, Your Honor, are where they do accuse Mr. Farley of murdering Mr. Drinks. But now we're left with this general demure, certain acts are racketeering of this list, so let's interpret them as literally only the ones that say acts of racketeering, which one of them is murder, 173, 176. So if we interpret here in that way, and certain of which, in the way I've said, we're left with just 173 and 176. But Your Honor, clearly those then allege the same exact thing. And I know the state's gonna get up here and say, well, they're not the same exact thing because they satisfy different elements. But Your Honor, they, in their manner, which they didn't have to articulate, they say that they, the defendants caused the death of Shamel Drinks, an associate of a rival gang. So even in, the, in that predicate act that's not gang activity, they talk about it being gang activity, saying that it was an associate of a rival gang and that they shot him as an act of racketeering activity. And then again, we have the same murder of the same person on the same time as the same alleged supposed gang, and it's worded the same, Judge. It's slightly different, but in both cases, they're talking about gang activity and a murder. And so that's not a pattern. You can't say that those two acts of racketeering activity constitute a pattern because they're the same act. 
they're going to say, well, one is the act as part of a gang and one is the act itself. But when they articulate the act itself, they say an associate of a rival gang. So they're saying there's gang activity even in that count itself. So they've just messed up here, Judge. They've left open an ambiguity to a general demure where I have found an interpretation that Mr. Farley in this indictment is only being accused of one act of racketeering activity. And Your Honor will see that um, the definition of, of racketeering act of conspiracy to commit racketeering activity is a pattern, and a pattern is defined as two or more acts, whereas they've only, under my interpretation, accused Mr. Farley of one act of racketeering, which can't withstand a general demur. Um, and so that's why it should be dismissed um, as a general demur for count one. And, Your Honor, my relevant definitions are just, you know, OCGA for the record, 16-4-4, which talks about the pattern. Um, OCGA 16-4-3, again, defines that there needs to be at least two acts of racketeering to constitute a pattern. Um, I cite to Black's Law Dictionary where they concede the inherent ambiguity of the word herein. Um, and then I, I cite to Meeks v. State. Um, and Johnson v. State, as um, it talks about Demure's, Your Honor. So that's basically the, the argument of count one, is that there is an interpretation that I've just articulated where it leaves only 173 and 176, and that those are the same exact thing, even the murder, because it's alleged as gang activity in its manner, and that um, that leaves us with just one act, the alleged murder of Mr. Schmel Drinks as part of gang activity, and that's not a pattern, Your Honor, that's just one. All right, sir. Anything else? Uh, no, Your Honor. I can answer. I know it's like a, a lot, but I can answer any questions uh, that the court has about that. No, I'm good. I'm good. Th thank you, Ms. Menez. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, go ahead, Mr. Floyd. Um, two versions of this argument. The short one is wrong, 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 and wrong. The longer one is slightly more detailed. Let's go with the longer one. I'll go with the longer one. Because it, just because it might get reviewed at some point. I, I, under, I understand. All right, so um, thank you. This argument has nothing to do with the text of the statute. Uh, and it has nothing to do with the governing legal standards. There is no I have found an interpretation standard. And there is no standard applicable to general demurs that in, endor, endorses or indulges strained or artificial interpretations. General demurs are not favored, and they are not construed in favor of the defendant. That's the starting point. So that the foundation is wrong. Specifically turning to RICO, it would behoove Mr. Farley to read the indictment as carefully and the statute, to read the statute as carefully as he reads the indictment. First, 1614.4c1 is the conspiracy provision. It does not use the term racketeering activity. It does not use the term pattern of racketeering activity. Okay? Mr. Menez is absolutely dead wrong when he says a pattern is an element of a conspiracy violation. The law is precisely to the opposite, and we cited the law in our brief. It is absolutely clear that a substantive violation is not a prerequisite to a conspiracy violation. If it was, the conspiracy violation would collapse into the substantive violation. It would become meaningless. And that would violate the most fundamental rule of statutory construction, which is the court does not read so much as a word, much less an entire subpart of the statute, to have no meaning whatsoever. Okay? The fundamental component I mean, of, of a substantive violation is a pattern of racketeering activity. That's an A violation. That's a B violation. That is not what the state alleged. The state alleged a C violation. The C violation requires an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. It does not require a pattern of racketeering activity. Point one. Point two, um, he argues that overt acts must be acts of racketeering activity. No, same mistake. There is no reference to acts of racketeering activity in C. The case law is clear that an acts of racketeering activity are not what are required. And as a foreshadowing to some of the other arguments that are going to be made, there are 
overt acts, 191 overt acts alleged. A subset of those, it's about 70 within, give or take a couple, are acts of racketeering activity. They fall within the definition. Every single time the state alleges an overt act that is also an act of racketeering activity, it has said so. It has said an overt act that is also an act of racketeering activity, and it has said the exact incorporating provision from RICO that incorporates that underlying offense. Right? So we, we have drawn that distinction, but the point is both are good enough. And the fundamental, so the fun, first fundamental component of Mr. Farley's argument is we have to allege a pattern. That is wrong. The second fundamental argument is any overt acts we allege must be acts of racketeering activity. Equally wrong. The third argument that he alleges is that, or that he asserts, is that there has to be an overt act, he says, consisting of a pattern. We've already taken care of that one. But that there has to be an overt act by Mr. Farley. Again, equally wrong. Overt act can be by any conspirator. That's exactly what the statute says. And that any conspirator commit an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. Pasha v. State, which we've cited, makes this point perfectly clear. So does Whaley v. State, uh, which we've also cited. Uh, and um, uh, as Whaley said, it, it has the basic principle of conspiracy, which we, we've talked about in various motions during the course of this. But Pasha uh, says that each actor in a conspiracy is responsible for the overt actions undertaken by all the other co-conspirators in furtherance of the conspiracy. Those 191 overt acts, those are all Mr. Farley's in a conspiracy case. Okay? Whaley says the same thing. A, co a conspirator is responsible for his own racketeering activity and that of his co-conspirators. Whaley went on to say, this means that everything said, written, or done by any of the conspirators in execution or furtherance of the common purpose is deemed to have been said, done, or written by each of them. So this parsing that Mr. Farley is trying to engage into fails at its inception. He got the wrong requirement when he says pattern. He's got the wrong requirement when he says racketeering activity. And he's got the wrong requirement when he says it all has to be engaged in by Mr. Farley. This case would survive General Demur if you wiped out every single overt act specifically alleged to have been committed by Mr. Farley. It would still survive General Demur because he could not admit the allegations and, uh, and still be innocent. Uh, for that reason, the General Demur should be overruled. And, uh, Your Honor, I what, what about the issue of the special demur? Um. Uh, well, he hasn't, he hasn't, at least here, asserted any argument. He began by saying this is a general demur, and he hasn't asserted an argument relative to the special demur. If he had, it wouldn't work uh, for the reason that the indictment is very detailed. You know, one of, the, one of the things that sort of becomes a hallmark of cases like this is that one defendant gets up and complains about how long the indictment is, and the next defendant gets up and complains that the indictment doesn't have enough detail about him. Um, but you know, we've set forth the standard for special demurs in, in uh, uh, the brief. Uh, Sanders v. State, a 2022 Supreme Court decision, says that, and it basically uh, says, while Sanders may desire greater detail about how the conspiracy resulted in Singletary's death, it is not required that the indictment give every detail of the crime. A pause, because I'm not quoting anymore. That is particularly true in a conspiracy case where the state is not required to allege the details of overts and where the overts need not be crimes themselves. They can actually be lawful acts as long as they promote the objective of the conspiracy. Here we have many that are unlawful and constitute racketeering activity. We have others that are unlawful but are not within the definition of racketeering activity. And then we have a third category. They're just overts. All of those can be found within the 191. But as, single, as Sanders went on to say, instead, the additional detail desired by Sanders may be supplemented by the pretrial discovery 
he receives and any investigation counsel conducts. Um, every detail need not be in it. They have to be sufficient to assert a plea of former jeopardy and sufficient to be able to defend. Um, the Supreme Court dealt with this in Kimbrough. This is an argument that's coming in a couple more motions about the nexus argument. The Supreme Court basically said, you don't need to plead everything. We don't need pages and pages. We're not requiring pages and pages. You just have to have something. We have a lot more than that something here. We have dates, names, places, names of victims. Uh, it is set forth in a chronological order uh, where there are multiple actors involved in the overt act. We have alleged who those people are by name. That is more than sufficient details to survive a special demur, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Um, I'll, t I'll, I'll pause just a second, and I'll let you. I'll let you come back up and argue the motion to sever the counts, and then the uh, his motion to sever his defendant, and then constitutionality. Okay. 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 All we'll right. come. You want to come back to the other demurs? Yeah. yeah just in, unless you want to address them right now. It's a, Your Honor. We're. I'm at your pleasure. Yeah. That was only to hear one. I titled it amended special in general because that's my original topic of motions, but that was amended as just a general in your amendment. I didn't even argue two through seven, but I do want to address his arguments about this general. And Judge, just one moment, please. We have our own um, demurs, but these counts relate to Mr. Nichols, Mr. Stillwell, as, as well, and the overlap. So I want to adopt, at least insofar as an argument is concerned, um, <clears throat> some of them relate to, uh, specifically to Mr. Farley, but to the content of the indictment itself. Um, I, I, I would reserve my right to <clears throat> respectfully disagree with Mr. Floyd uh, um, in what he has said because they have pled, by the way, a pattern of racketeering activity. And if that ain't what they mean, then they shouldn't have pled it, number one. Um, number two, conspiracy is a specific intent crime. You have to specifically intend to commit the underlying predicate felony, which includes a pattern of racketeering racketeering activity, you have to have that specific intent. So I want to adopt <clears throat> and reserve because some of these things relate specifically to Mr. Farm. So, Thank you, Mr. Harvey. On behalf of Mr. Stillwell, I too would like to adopt and echo the sentiments of Mr. <coughs> Harvey and Mr. Your Honor, I don't think you're inviting argument on those motions separately, but I can address it if you want. Um, well, but I'll just I'll just point out that if 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 we have in fact pled a pattern, that's the end of that motion. <laughs> and your honor, it's just not. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah. You pled the fact that the conspiracy that the conspiracy was they did unlawfully conspire to acquire and maintain directly and indirectly. Through a pattern of racketeering activity. That's what the indictment says. You pled it. And if it doesn't contain that, you're wrong about saying we don't need to put it in there. And yes, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Floyd, you want to, okay, since they've, since they've started to uh, uh, have multiple streams of arguments, you want to respond to that? I, I'll, do it, I'll do it however you want. Yeah. Okay, sir, go ahead and respond to that, Mr. Harvey's assertion. Okay. Uh, it, we're being quoted out of context. The objective of the conspiracy entails the commission of a pattern of racketeering activity. Alleging that a pattern of racketeering activity was actually committed is not an element of a RICO conspiracy. The offense is the agreement as opposed to the pattern. That's why there is not a reference to a pattern of racketeering activity in C1. Mr. Harvey is just mistaken on that point. And the specific intent, there is no separate specific intent requirement for a RICO conspiracy other than the agreement itself. That's it. There's not an, under, an underlying second layer of intent to commit a predicate act. 
It's not, it's just not a requirement. It's not. Okay. Accuracy is definitionally a specific intent crime because you have to have the specific intent to agree to commit the underlying alleged act. It is not a general intent crime. Conspiracy to commit a crime is a specific intent crime. So, and, and I know I'm, I'm a little bit out of order, and Mr. Floyd is way smarter than I will be. But um, I might just want to reserve my right to argue to maintain the argument in a doctor's argument. And I, I, I'm fine if he reserves, Your Honor. I'd like the opportunity to res respond in full, too. Because this, be is, this is not part of Mr. Manetis' motion. That's cool. That's, you're correct. And, Your Honor, uh, Mr. Floyd, do you want to go ahead and finish his, because uh, he's got like seven of them. Did, um, the uh, He's got this. One is dismiss count one. Two is overt action jurisdiction. Three is overt acts and insufficient specificity in vague terms. Four is unindicted co-conspirators. Five is insufficient nexus. Six is distinguished between overt acts and predicate acts. And, se and, and, and seven is uh, duplicative uh, counts. And, and the way we've allocated responsibility for these, Your Honor, one through six are mine, uh, as well as severance and, and constitutionality. And I'm. I'm at the court's pleasure. If uh, if we want to go through them all right now, I'm ready. Yeah, let's let, let me let you finish those two, and then I'll let him address if he's got anything more. Because he, because um, so, Mr. Mendez, let him finish, okay? Well, Your Honor, I, I never made my arguments about two through six yet. I thought you did. No, Judge, that was all just number one, and I want to address some of his misstatements about number one as well just now. Okay. Uh, before the court rules, so Mr. Harvey is right about that specific intent, first of all, and but let's okay. back up. Okay, but but let's not get too far down the weeds. No, I know, okay? Your Honor. I All right. In specific intent is for they're inchoate crimes, okay? Right, right, right. All right. So, yes, you do have to prove. You know, they have a specific. There are specific intent crimes, but that's an issue of proof. Right, Judge. Okay. And right. so to back up though to several things that were wrong, wrong, wrong about what he said. So look, he says there is no. I have found an interpretation about General Demir's, when that's exactly what a General Demir is. If you can interpret the indictment in a way that the person has not committed a crime, meaning they have not committed all the essential elements of the count, then that's what a General Demir is. So that's just a bit of gaslighting, a bit of, oh, if I just say it confidently and say it in a cool way, then I'm right. No, he's not. He's there, that's exactly what a General Demir is. When there's an interpretation of the indictment, that the person's not guilty and has not satisfied all the elements, it has to be dismissed. And that's exactly the interpretation that I've presented to the court. And then Mr. Floyd tries to get up here and misread the statute talking about, oh, we did it under subsection C. Yeah, I know that. That's why I filed the motion. Subsection C, Your Honor, says, it shall be unlawful for any person to conspire or endeavor to violate any of the provisions of subsection A or B. A or B. You need at least one of them, and he's going to come up here and say, oh, we only needed C. Well, you need at least A or B in both of the ways that someone can commit C. And then they have these two ways. A person violates this subsection C when either one of these two happen. He or she, together with one or more person, conspires to violate any of the provisions of subsection A or B. So you do have to violate subsection A or B to violate subsection C. So how can he come up here and say that? Or let's look at the other way then. Number two, subsection C2. He or she endeavors to violate any of the provisions of subsection A or B of this code section. And both A and B have the word pattern in it. And pattern is defined in the statute as two or more. And they've only alleged one against Mr. Farley. And so the way this in indictment can be interpreted is dismissed by General Demir. And just because they can present the court with their interpretation, that's not enough. They need an indictment that is perfect in form within its four corners and that someone can't admit the facts to under any interpretation of innocence. And they haven't done that here, Judge. They've alleged it the way they alleged it, and that's on them. And as it pertains to just Mr. Farley, because only two of those acts are duplicate, are actual acts of racketeering alleged, and they're both the same act, that's why it's dismissed by General Demure. 
And that's why I put it as number one, because we shouldn't have to argue two through six anymore, because number one is just, as far as it pertains to Mr. Farley, dismissed by a general demure, by the exact way that Mr. Floyd said not to interpret it, because yes, there's an interpretation where he's only being accused of one act of racketeering, and yes, under subsection C, you need a pattern. He tried to come up here and say you don't need a pattern in subsection C, and that's just not true, because I just read the whole code section to this court, Your Honor, and in both ways you can commit C, it says either A or B has to be violated, and in both A and B, the word pattern of racketeering activity is included, Your Honor. So that's why, for Mr. Farley, this general demure should be granted. And so um, I can go on to the rest of my demurs, but I'll, I'll wait the court's ruling on the first one to okay. see if we even need to go there. All right, go ahead. Four cases, Your Honor. United States v. Brown, 11th Circuit, 2007, defendant may violate RICO's conspiracy provision even if he did not commit a substantive violation of RICO. United States v. Alonzo, 11th Circuit, 1984, um, defendant may be guilty of a RICO conspiracy violation even if he did not commit the substantive acts that would constitute violations of subsections A or B. United States v. Salinas, Supreme Court of the United States, defendant can be guilty of violating RICO conspiracy without violating a substantive provision. Cotman versus State, one of the APS cases, defendant uh, was found guilty of RICO conspiracy without proof of a substantive violation of A or B. And your honor, can is different than shall. Yeah, you can, but not with this one because of the way they wrote it. Okay. I'm gonna deny your motion, Mr. Ruiz, as it pertains to dismissal of count one. What, what, you have any other further argument on over at Acts? Uh, yes, Two. Judge. All right, let's go. Uh, a second demeanor is a special demeanor. Oh, no, no, sorry, Your Honor. The second one has to do with a, a jurisdictional argument. Because, Your Honor, if you follow some of the same things I articulated first about the indictment, you see that there are, in part three, certain overt acts that I believe... Um, under actually general demure need to be dismissed against Mr. Farley um, because they don't allege where exactly it was committed. They talk about released on social media. They say appear in a YouTube video. Well, Your Honor, YouTube is not a place. They didn't say that anyone in Georgia, because the Georgia RICO statute needs acts in Georgia. So all these social media ones that they have about Mr. Farley, for example, number, five, number 95, it says he appeared in a video released on social media. They didn't say that the video was made in Georgia. They didn't say that anyone in Georgia saw it. They just said that it was released on social media. And same thing with 103, Your Honor. It's a, they say that he appeared in a YouTube video. They don't say a YouTube video in Georgia. They don't say that anyone in Georgia saw the video. And so, Your Honor, that's the same for 110, 120, 132, and 141. 132 is a little different. It talks about engaging the conversation. But again, Your Honor, they say that Mr. Farley engaged in a conversation, which, by the way, is actually his clothing Instagram account as part of like a massive group message, and he doesn't even respond to it. So I don't know how that's engaging in a conversation with Mr. Williams. That's not how I define engaging in a conversation. But I'll move on from that, Judge. Regardless, it doesn't say where that conversation took place. Instagram is not a place. Instagram is not in Georgia. So they should have alleged that someone, that these people were in Georgia when they engaged in this conversation. Again, Your Honor, number 141, a photo released on social media displaying tattoos. Does not say those tattoos were seen on social media by anyone in Georgia or that he's ever been in Georgia or that those tattoos were made in Georgia. And we don't get to consider everything we know. For General Demir, we look at just the four corners of the indictment. So, Your Honor, um, going to my uh, authority and argument part, there's the there's federal case law about this, Your Honor. It's uh, Butte Mining, which is 76 F3D 287 291. That's out of the Ninth Circuit. How about the Eleventh Circuit or United States Supreme Court? That would be more persuasive to me. Well, Your Honor, yeah, I'm 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 using the interpretation of the federal statute. 
Right. Do you have any 11th Circuit interpretation that, on that's, that? That's not been addressed um, by the 11th Circuit, Your Honor. It, this happened to, This happened with a case about been RICO. Addressed by, our, by our Supreme Court? Uh, no, Your Honor. What I'm saying is that the Georgia statute exactly tracks the federal statute, and the federal statute's been interpreted to mean that those acts have to be in the jurisdiction of the court. Um, those are the cases I was going to bring up where um, in Butte Mining and the Sunil Trino, um, those, those acts were alleged possibly in foreign jurisdictions and that basically what I've articulated from part three also might have taken place outside the state of Georgia. So I don't think that needs the 11th Circuit. That's just, this is how federal RICO is interpreted. So why would we interpret Georgia RICO any different when it's tracked and written exactly the same way? And so, Your Honor, in those cases, um, the demurs were granted because the Ninth Circuit held that um, the defendant's conduct in the United States um, by use of the mail and the wires, paying a fair price for the mining company, <coughs> forming corporations, um, that those um, didn't actually refer to the fraud and that the actual fraudulent acts took place entirely outside the United States. And so here, there's an open interpretation that these acts, put, putting something on YouTube, appearing on social media, engaging in conversation, those acts could have occurred outside of Georgia and nothing specifically alleges them to have occurred inside Georgia. And so... Didn't venue, doesn't, doesn't the state have to prove that anyways as to each count by, by indirect or direct evidence? At trial to meet their burden of overcoming the presumption of innocence, but he's also entitled to a perfect indictment um, within the four corners regardless of looking at discovery or... I don't think the indictment, I mean, the count requires that you, that specifically that, because that's the state's burden of proof at trial. Well, Roger... It's implicit within, within each, within each right. count that the venue's got to be proven. It doesn't have to necessarily be pled. And, Your Honor, in, in those federal RICO cases, that wasn't enough to survive the general demurrer because of the way it was pleaded in the indictment. Okay. And so that's what right. I'm alleging here. And so... Because those acts can have occurred outside the jurisdiction, they can't survive uh, General Demir. So those but we don't know if they have occurred without, without, with outside the jurisdiction, do we? Right, Your Honor. We would have known that had they said appeared in a YouTube video seen by people in Georgia. It would be that simple, but they didn't do that. So that's why those overt acts, Your Honor. And there is um, case law about Demir is applying to actually individual overt acts as well, not just the entire conspiracy. And I have that, Your Honor, um, in my motion as well. That's uh, Ralston v. Cox. They talked about um, Okay, that seems to, yeah, 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 that seems to occur. I mean, you seem to be arguing overt acts and jurisdiction and insufficient specificity and vague terms, is that what you're kind of... That's the next one, Judge. I'm still on the second one, which is the jurisdictional argument about those overt acts. Because right. Ralston v. Cox, you can actually demur to the overt acts, because in that case, the lower court sustained the demur to counts two and three, and to the overt act number three of count one. Right. So I included that just to say that this court it has the authority to address demurs based on just the overt act. It doesn't have to be the entire count. Okay. So that's what I'm asking the court to do. Because the court has has denied my previous demur, I'm asking the court to narrow down the indictment to take out these, what I believe are general demurable things because of the jurisdiction argument. And so those overt acts, because they haven't, because they can be committed outside of Georgia, um, you know, just don't survive general demur. And that's much different than, I understand what Your Honor is saying about they don't have to prove venue, like they don't have to say in the exact count 55, oh, murder, Shermel drinks in Georgia, but the entire indictment talks about, oh, this is a Georgia conspiracy. But just like in Butte Mining and the Coca-Cola case and the Sunil Trail uh, cases that I cited, in those cases, yeah, it was a, a federal United States conspiracy, but those, you know, overt acts that were outside the jurisdiction possibly were, could not survive General Demir, Your Honor. So that's that's what I'm asking here. It would, it would have been simple to just say what exactly the overt act is doing because in the other ones, like when you say murder, smell, drinks, we can assume that happened in Georgia because it says honor about in this is in that. But it doesn't say that the YouTube video was seen by anyone outside Georgia. 
that's that's the problem that's missing your honor and it doesn't allege that it was created in Georgia the act they're alleging is appearing on social media and so that's what I contend to this court is that you can appear on social media outside the jurisdiction and that would have easily been solved if they would have just wrote seen by people in Georgia I think you know it's like a tree falling in the forest type of thing like you can allege that he appeared on it but then you also have to allege that it was seen otherwise it's not an overt act thank you Mr. Floyd? Yes. Briefly, Your Honor. Um, I am at a loss for this it has to be seen argument. I, I, I mean, I literally, Mr. Farley is basically coming up with every requirement he can possibly think of and throwing them out as though they're in the statute or they're in a case. They're not. Um, the reference to the Cox case Cox is a former Fifth Circuit case from 1941, 29 years before the federal statute was enacted, 39 years before the Georgia statute was enacted. Whatever else, and a civil case at that, whatever else it has to do with, it doesn't have anything to do with a demur to Georgia RICO. Um, most of the cases he cites are civil cases, not criminal cases. Different standards of pleading. The indictment on page 12 alleges that the crime took place in Fulton County, Georgia. Just to begin with, it's right there. Second, the text of OCGA 16143 sub 5, which is the definition of racketeering activity, makes it abundantly clear that acts committed outside Georgia, and in fact outside the United States, can be acts of racketeering activity or overt acts for purposes of Georgia RICO. It incorporates three categories of conduct. The first category we don't have to spend a lot of time on because those are specific violations of Georgia law. Right? And that's the overwhelming majority of what we're talking about here. Second, it incorporates the full definition, the entire definition of racketeering activity from federal RICO. So those are all federal offenses that can occur any place in the United States or any place in the extraterritorial jurisdiction of the United States. For example, one of those offenses is killing a United States citizen outside the territory of the United States because they're a United States citizen. So by its nature, it couldn't even happen within US territory. It's still an act of racketeering activity, right? And then just in case there was any doubt, there's a category of 12 generic acts, murder, um, arson, kidnapping, obstruction of justice are a few examples that are in violation of federal law, the law of any state, or the law of any United States territory, punishable by more than one year in prison. So the intent of the General Assembly to incorporate such activity is very clear. We're not talking about things that happen outside the state of Georgia anyway. We didn't allege they happen outside the state of Georgia, but if they did, it wouldn't make a difference. On top of that, there's the Overton case, which we cited in our brief, uh, which is not mentioned by Mr. Farley. Um, Overton is a Georgia RICO conspiracy case out of Richmond County, where a significant part of the racketeering activity that occurred occurred in the state of South Carolina. Obviously, we all know Augusta's on the Savannah River. There was a kidnapping on the Georgia side. The victim, unfortunately, was transported across to the South Carolina side. He was locked in a trunk. The car was set on fire. He died. Okay. Act of kidnapping, Georgia. Act of murder, South Carolina. Both in the indictment. Both supported the conviction. Both are specifically cited by the Georgia Court of Appeals in response to the sufficiency of the evidence challenge. Um, really, Mr. Farley is arguing what the probata has to be, not the allegata. He's talking, as you mentioned, he's talking about what we ultimately have to prove at trial to carry our burden. He's not talking really about what we have to allege. Um, but the, uh, the sense that there is some possibility that an act occurred outside the state of Georgia because the state did not specifically allege that it occurred inside the state of Georgia. I, I don't know how that has any impact at all in a conspiracy case where the state has alleged the conspiracy violation occurred here. And the argument that anything that happens outside the state is automatically excluded 
simply does not fit with the statutory text. All right. Um, as it pertains to uh, Special and General Murder, two overt acts in jurisdiction, this court will deny the defendant's motion. All right, Mr. Uh, Menendez, uh, number three, overt acts and insufficient specificity of vague terms. Yes, Judge. This is a just special demeanor as to several parts of the indictment. Yeah, I'm referring again to part three, the uh, only overt acts that Mr. Farley's alleged to be in out of 191. That's number 95, 103, 110, 120, 132, and uh, 141. Those are the ones I'm talking about here. Your Honor, here, um, the court's actually pretty clear. I mean, uh, the Sarajewski case you know, held that um, that indictment was deficient and that it lacked any description of what was alleged to be threatening communication. So here in this motion, Your Honor, I'm shifting our focus to these vague terms that they're putting in the indictment that Mr. Farley is entitled to have be more specific so that he can be prepared to defend himself at trial because he is entitled to an indictment perfect in form within its four corners. And the key thing here, Your Honor, under Sarajewski is that it needs to be sufficient so that he can avail himself of a defense to prepare himself for a defense. He's not given enough intelligence here about what he's even going to be fighting. So just like when Sarajewski dismissed that count for threatening communication, or endeavor to impede, that's what I'm arguing here, Your Honor. There's also the Delaby case that didn't survive a special demur. That had the term intimidation being insufficiently specific. So, Your Honor, each of these overt acts, except for 173 and 176, do contain terms that are so vague that we can't possibly prepare our defense intelligently within the four corners of the indictment, Your Honor. Um, and he can't be sufficiently apprised of what he's going to be prepared to meet at trial. 173 and 176, I do concede, okay, you know, those are specific enough. It talks about shooting a person with a gun. That, okay, that shooting with a gun, that can't be committed in any other kind of way. Um, but importantly, Your Honor, the Delaby court holds that the term intimidation was impermissibly vague because intimidation can be, in, you know, committed in so many different ways. And again, Your Honor, despite its age, Ralston v. Cox is still good law. It's an example where the court has the authority to demur specific overt acts of conspiracies, not just whole conspiracy. And so, Your Honor, now I want to uh, go to each of these, each of these acts and, and the uh, allegations and how they're vague. So number 95, again, appearing in a video released on social media, doesn't say what that means. What do you mean appear in a video? And just the proof of what I'm saying, Your Honor, is the way it's been talked about at different points during this case in the proffers. You know, appear in a video, appearing doing what? Saying what? Rapping? Dancing? What? It's just that doesn't say, like, appear in a video, Your Honor. It doesn't say anything about how that's furthering the objectives of anything or what that even means, Your Honor. Same thing with uh, number 103, that he appeared in a YouTube video titled Mob Ties and that the defendants were splashing gang signs with lyrics. He doesn't say... Does he even say these lyrics? Does he mouth them? Did he write them? Does he rap them? What? It doesn't say, Your Honor. It just says he appeared in a YouTube video and then says defendants were flashing gang signs with lyrics. Which defendants? It should have said which ones. It should have said what they mean by appear. It should have said what they mean by the lyrics. What is the significance of the lyrics and Tupac and hit him up? It doesn't say. It just says he appeared in there. Same thing with um, 110, Your Honor, a YouTube video of a song of Mr. Wunny Lee saying vaguely and sufficiently that he appeared in it. You know, at first brought bond hearings, they tried to say like he was saying the lyrics or he had something to do with the lyrics. And while I don't think those lyrics are, are probative or have anything to do with reality, even so, he's not alleged to have written them, rapped them, mouthed them. I want to know, he needs to know what appear in a YouTube video means and then they just say some lyrics. And Your Honor, now number 120, a photo released on social media that he posed for a photo. What does that mean, posed for a photo? How is that the overt act? What about posing in a photo and that it was released on social media? What is that? What is an overt act about releasing something on social media? Again, doesn't say anybody saw it and doesn't say what they mean by posed. So then go to 132, that he engaged in a conversation. 
this is the this one really needs to be defined around engage in a conversation that's vague what do you mean engage talking and talking back having your account that you maybe you don't even manage get a message from other people that you don't respond to is that what they mean that's what it is but we need to look at it within the four corners your honor and so to say vaguely oh he engaged in a conversation and then say stuff that they allege mr williams to have said what is that how do i defend against that what does that even mean same for 141 your honor posing for a photo i already made those arguments um for act 110. so judge those are the ones they're all impermissibly vague they each contain at least one vague term that needs to be further defined because it's not defined enough just like in delaby and just like in sarajewski where those things were not sufficiently defined here i would argue to the court we have terms that are even more vague than the terms in those courts which didn't withstand a special demur. And I know the state's gonna cite the case law that, oh, we just have to track the language of the statute, but that's only the first part. It's a two-part analysis. They have to track the language of the statute, but they still have to sufficiently appraise the defendant of what he's gonna be defending himself from. And these vague terms rob us of the chance to do that, Your Honor, and so that's why those overt acts um, should be dismissed by a special demur because they are impermissibly vague. All right, thank you, sir. All right, Mr. Floyd. Yes, Your Honor. Um, first point is the state is not required to allege every overt act, and the state is not required to allege overt acts in great detail. Uh, that's the law. It's, they are not separate counts. They are overt acts as part of an overarching count, and so the level of specificity uh, which Mr. Farley is seeking is simply not required. Um, the, the, I, I can only say it, it strikes me as feigned confusion here. As to each of these acts, the state has alleged the specific date. It has alleged everybody who's involved. It's not like he doesn't know what we're talking about. Okay? Uh, the individuals in almost every one of these acts uh, that are referenced, other than Mr. Farley, are code defendants. Um, the idea that he is bewildered at what it means to appear in a video, to appear in a photograph, is simply an untenable argument. Um, what does it mean to be released? Well, people talk about releasing videos, releasing movies, releasing all con TV shows, et cetera, all the time. Social media, not exactly a vague term. And m numerous times we've mentioned the specific platform, like YouTube. Um, a conversation, again, not, not real confusing, particularly since we've quoted language from the specific conversation. And he has the videos. He has the photos. He has the transcripts and recordings of the conversations. And so under the standards that we've cited before, including Sanders versus State, that is more than sufficient. We're not talking about something where Mr. Farley wasn't present, and we're not talking about something that Mr. Farley hasn't received in discovery. We're not talking about something that's some grand mystery about what's going on. Um, I've never seen a case that said this is demurable, and I don't think this is going to be the first one. If your honor has any questions, I'd happy, be happy to address them. No, I don't. Um, uh, very briefly about that, discovery has nothing to do with it. It's not feigned or not feigned. It's that we need to do legal analysis and we need to put everything out of our mind except for the four corners of your bedroom. The is very clear about that. So it doesn't matter that I've seen the videos. He's entitled indictment perfect informant in its four quarters to sufficiently appraise himself. So all that extra stuff is actually not part of the court's analysis. It needs to be restricted to the indictment itself only. So we are going to feign ignorance because we pretend for purposes of error that we don't know anything else except for the indictment. That's what it means to say in the four quarters. Your Honor, Sanders versus State, unanimous decision, Georgia Supreme Court, 2022. The additional detail desired by Saunders may be supplemented by the pretrial discovery he receives any investigation or counsel conducts. All right. 
Um, I'm going to deny uh, your motion in regards to General Demer, Special General Demers 3, overt acts and insufficient specificity of vague terms. Let's move on to the issue involving unindicted co-conspirators, Mr. Menez. Okay, thank you, Judge. The, next, the last three are actually very short and straightforward. I can tell you all three. That'd be fine. Okay. Unindicted co-conspirators, insufficient nexus, and um, distinguishment between overt and predicate acts. Yes, Judge. Those are the same arguments under Special Demir that he's entitled to an indictment, perfect in form, that within its four corners puts him on notice of what he's going to defend himself against. The way that fails in this regard is that they just say in the indictment that Mr. Farley and the other co-defendants, together with unindicted co-conspirators, did these things. Well, for the indictment to be perfect in substance and form within its four corners, they need to say who those unindicted co-conspirators are. So that is the substance of this motion, Your Honor, merely that it doesn't withstand a special demure because it includes these unindicted co-conspirators without telling us anything about them or who they are. So that's that one. Um, number five, Your Honor, it's just an insufficient nexus because um, under Schiffel's v. Kemper Financial Services, which again, yeah, it's a civil case, but that's something unique about RICO is that it does have a civil component and a criminal one. And there's no difference in how those are decided. There's a difference at trial of what their burden is, either preponderance or beyond reasonable doubt. But as far as demurs, there is no difference. And there is a civil application of RICO. And in that application, um, Schiffel's v. Kemper Financial Services, um, they say that to allege a conspiracy to violate Georgia RICO, the state would have to plead that each defendant knowingly agreed to conduct the affairs of a particular enterprise and that each conspirator agreed to the commission of the predicate acts, and that each defendant knew that those predicate acts were part of a pattern of racketeering. So how can I do that when I don't know who these supposed unindicted co-conspirators are? So, Your Honor, again, um, under Schiffels, it says conclusory allegations of conspiracy are not sufficient to allege a criminal act under OCGA 16-4-14 and 16-14-8. Rather, the state must allege facts from which one can infer each defendant's agreement to violate the laws the state contends constitute the racketeering activity. So, Your Honor, for those reasons, it can't survive a special demur to have an indictment that says, oh, together with unindicted co-conspirators, because then how are you on notice of how to defend yourself? How are you on notice about what attorney you want to hire, or whether you want to make a plea, when you don't know whether that specific intent is going to be satisfied? You don't know who these unindicted co-conspirators are. That's a, a pretty simple thing, Your Honor. I think that, that line, unindicted co-conspirators, either needs to be removed or needs to be re-indicted to tell us who those unindicted co-conspirators are. Um, as far as the insufficient nexus, Your Honor, um, that's the one I was just talking about before that, that the allegations need to uh, allege facts to infer that each defendant's agreement to violate the laws. That was actually, I was talking about the nexus, Judge, my bad. Um, there, they don't, they don't allege that, Your Honor. So the nexus between the enterprise and the conspiracy is insufficient by this indictment. And then lastly, Your Honor, um, they say overt and predicate acts, the part that I referred to in count one, where um, they say that some of these, certain of which are acts of racketeering, that's again not acceptable under a special demure. They need to say which are the overt acts and which are the predicate acts. They can't just list them and then say certain of these are acts of racketeering. They need to say these are the acts of racketeering, these are the overt acts that aren't. Because otherwise, how do I know which one they mean is which? So those three, Judge, um, insufficient nexus. Um, that applies to the entire count one. But as far as the distinguishing between overt and predicate acts and unindicted co-conspirators, that's just something that also needs to be included, Your Honor. All right, sir. Mr. Floyd? Yes, Your Honor. Um, so we have unindicted co-conspirators, insufficient nexus, and distinguishment between overt and predicate acts. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, and then we'll move on. I think there's, uh, Mr. Mr. Um, Menendez, you haven't dealt with duplicative counts. Oh, Your Honor, I, I think they, Mr. Floyd's got a different copy. I'll, I'll handle that response, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 All right. So on uh, number four, Your Honor, undidicted co-conspirators, um, no case uh, cited by Mr. Farley that says we're required to identify those and kind of misses the fact that they are unindicted. 
And there's a problem with identifying individuals who are unindicted in an indictment because they don't have the ability to come in and demur or otherwise seek relief. Their reputation can be devastated, but they don't have standing to come in and do that. That is why it presents, um, I can't say it never happens, but that is why the state and also the federal government are very reluctant to do that. And you see things like unindicted co-conspirator A or unindicted co-conspirator 1 referred to in indictments because that person doesn't have a chance to come in and respond. They're not a party. Um, there are some jurisdictions that suggest it may be unethical to do so. It's not a universal rule. It's a practice, but it makes sense. Second, we've identified all, all unindicted co-conspirators who are known to us in discovery. Uh, we haven't held anything back on that. Um, as far as insufficient nexus, uh, the case is charged in the language of the statute, and it specifically references the nexus. And all nexus is is a connection. There has to be some kind of relationship. Kimbrough is, is the controlling case on this, unanimous Georgia Supreme Court case written by Justice Peterson. Um, and it basically says it doesn't take much uh, and gives a number of examples. We have specifically alleged they conspire to associate together and with others for the common purposes of illegally obtaining money and property through a pattern of racketeering activity and conducting and participating in the enterprise through a pattern of racketeering activity. That's exactly what a nexus is. Uh, and that is more than sufficient under Kimbrough. Uh, we then go on to give specific examples of what was done, such as preserving, protecting, and enhancing the reputation, power, and territory of the enterprise through acts of racketeering activity, including murder, assault, and threats of violence. That money, weapons, and other property were obtained through acts of racketeering activity, including robbery, theft, and the unlawful sale and distribution of drugs. Um, we also allege that persons who were involved in the conspiracy to uh, participate in and conduct the enterprise obstructed law enforcement investigations and court proceedings through witness intimidation and attacks upon law enforcement officers. That's drawing the connection between the conduct and the enterprise. That is all that is required. Um, distinguishing between overt acts and predicate acts, we did. I mean, we did exactly what Mr. Farley claims we didn't do, and it's right in the indictment. It's a key dramatic moment when the screen went dead black on me as I picked, just as I picked it up. Um, the, Your Honor, the, uh, I'll just start with Act One, and I'll blessedly stop with Act One because there's 191 of them. But we, in that case, we talk about uh, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, a firearm against the person of Reginald Pettis. Go through the allegation. In violation of Georgia law pursuant to 16.521, which is an act of racketeering activity under OCGA 16.43 sub 5A little v and an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. Where it is both, we say exactly that. We do it over 70 times. Where it is only an overt act, we do not make the reference to, um, the, uh, 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 to the underlying incorporating provision from RICO. Uh, an example of that is number seven, which involves Mr. Murphy. We consistently did that throughout the indictment. That's exactly what he's complaining of. The thing he says is missing is there. Okay. That's all I have right now, Your Honor. All right, sir. Um, in terms of... Uh, Can I tag along to the first part of that one? The, the unindicted co-conspirators, not the, not the other ones, but I do have a similarly situated motion with regard to the identity of unindicted co-conspirators in the... In, in the indictment does say the defendant conspired to associate together and with others 
doesn't say what the other who the others are and and we can argue this at a separate time I, I have no I have no problem with that but I do want to say in contradiction to what mr. Floyd said that we routinely I mean routinely file motions for the names and identities of unindicted co-conspirators. They may not be put in the indictment, but we routinely are provided with a list of unindicted co-conspirators because we all are entitled to know who we have conspired with, number one, and whose statements may or may not be able to be used against us under 801 D2E. So I just want to tag in on that one. All right, thank you, sir. All right, based upon the arguments uh, in the applicable case law, uh, I'm going to deny defendants uh, unindicted, uh, amended special and general numbers for unindicted co-conspirators. I'm going to deny insufficient nexus. That's general numbers, special numbers five. I'm going to deny um, distinguishment between overt and predicate acts. And uh, I think that gets us to um, uh, the duplicative counts in terms of general and special demurs, as well as the motion to sever counts, motion to sever the trial of the defendant, motion to declare the Georgia gang statute and corresponding r rule for. Uh, Rule of Evidence uh, 418 unconstitutional and the Georgia RICO statute unconstitutional. And Your Honor, I was wondering, I know we're getting late into the day. I'm going to be here all day, all week. Uh, so if the court would like to Two do, shows daily. Here's the one I'm doing uh, tomorrow and just hear Mr. Floyd's. That's, that's as amenable to me or the court. Okay. Mr. Floyd, what else are you arguing, sir? Um, I've got severance and constitutionality, Your Honor. All right, let's go ahead and, and roll those up at this point in time, and then I can. Is that the only other two, Ms. Rosenwasser or Hamler Rest? Uh, I believe the only, yeah, I think it's those, and then I'm handling the uh, the one about the duplicative. And yes. I'm sure I can. We can, we can, we can, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll push that till tomorrow along with Perfect. the other ones related as it relates to you. But just so we, we handle the ones involving Mr. Floyd yes. this evening. So, sir, if you could go ahead and continue with that. Okay. Uh, well, I, I think Mr. Menendez may want to make his argument first. All right. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm prepared to respond to both. So you're going to do the uh, motion to sever? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, that's just, just his, not the counts, just the severance, right? Uh, I'm, I was going to do both. Okay, you can do, okay, so that's, yes. you'll do the motion to sever counts and the trial. And then the unconstitutionality of the gang statute? Uh, RICO statute. RICO statute. Okay, all right. And, Your Honor, I can take the gang statute, or I believe Mr. Carlson was interested in that one, but if he's... And 418, yeah, you can... Okay, that's, that. that's fine. That's fine. Okay, all right. Okay, Mr. Mr. Menez, go ahead, sir. Yes, thank you, Judge. Um, as far as severing counts, <clears throat> what I'm asking here, Your Honor, for Mr. Farley is to sever his trial into count one, the RICO count, and then another trial that has... Um, the other counts that he's alleged to be in, which is 49, 50, um, 51, and 54. So, Your Honor, Johnson states that pretty clearly that um, when two or more crimes of the same or general nature are committed against different persons at different times and places, and they're charged in separate counts of an indictment, severance is mandatory upon the defendant's motion if the crimes are joined solely because of their same or similar character. Your Honor, that's Johnson v. State, 364, Georgia Ave, 543. Um, that's from 2022. Um, it goes on to say that if the offenses are not joined solely because they're the same or similar character, an evidence of one charge offense would be admissible as a similar transaction during trial on another charge offense. The trial court's vested with discretion in deciding whether to grant the motion to sever. So there's nothing commanding, Your Honor, to do it one way or the other. Um, but I am asking Your Honor to do that because the court does go on to say in that case that in making this decision, the court must consider the number of offenses, the complexity of the charges, that's crucial, and the complexity of the evidence and determine whether a jury will be able to fairly and intelligently parse the evidence and apply the law. So here, Your Honor, we have a completely unfair trial as it counts to the murder counts 
Because here what we have, if you were tried just on the murder counts, we have a person who's an entrepreneur networking and finds himself riding in the backseat of a car that's behind another car and then something happens where we don't know the circumstances. So, Your Honor, that's a very different kind of trial than me having to fight that on its own versus me having to fight that now with all these people and all these attorneys and all this evidence of RICO going back to 2013, 2015, wiretaps, all this stuff, just to simply decide whether sitting in the backseat of a car makes you a party to a murder when there's no other assistance alleged and he's merely present, merely associated. And so, Your Honor, to get up here and then you're going to tell the jury, oh, mere association doesn't count on these counts, but then here's a whole RICO case where the entire nature of the case is association, which is okay. I mean, I disagree with RICO, as we'll find out from our other motion, but to do a RICO count and then these murder counts together is just, you know, not fair, Your Honor. And they are joined solely because they're the same and similar character. Um, so that's, that's that, Your Honor. I mean, there is nothing... There's the murder of Mr. Schmell drinks and then the, the jury's analysis of the burden of proof on that is going to be just completely confused by the complexity of the other case. And then it really is just this presence and this association that ties him into the RICO. So under Johnson, Your Honor, I'm just asking this court to sever um, count one from the rest of the counts just for Mr. Farley. All right. Uh, go ahead and argue the rest of the, um, that's your motion to sever counts. What about the trial? And then you, you can deal with the gang statute, your argument on the gang statute and the, uh, RICO statute. Yes, Judge. So, I uh, admittedly, this, admittedly, this motion to sever the trials is a lot stronger. Um, and I do think it's less discretionary and leads, if we don't sever it, to a situation where Mr. Farley's rights are just completely just trashed. So, for example, the biggest reason, Your Honor, is because there's so much evidence admitted against one co-defendant that wouldn't be admitted against him. Okay, but what I think is the strongest argument, Your Honor, is just the scale of this. We've had all these pretrial hearings about how it's going to take six to nine months. And so, Your Honor, to, to have a defendant like Mr. Farley who doesn't have the resources like some of the other defendants who we now see still don't have an attorney, Your Honor. So I think the proof is right behind me how difficult it is for someone to hire an attorney of their choosing free of conflict, which is his right under the Sixth Amendment. He has a right under the Sixth Amendment to an attorney of his choosing free of conflict. Had it not been for me agreeing to do the case, that would be impossible. And that's impossible for a lot of the co-defendants, Your Honor. We've seen that. When you try 28 people at once, you're like taking up all the private attorneys of the city that you live in, and you're asking that private attorney who has had to go through years of training, hundreds of thousands of dollars of education, and now these clients essentially rent us out for their advocacy. And that's just not fair, Your Honor. It's like, oh, you're gonna go to the prom, we're gonna rent you a limo, but now, oh, actually, this problem's gonna last six to nine months and you're gonna have to rent a limo every single day. You're gonna have to rent out Mr. Manettis to sit there with you every day and pay him by the hour. That's not fair. It's not fair, Judge, so that will be solved by severing the trial of Mr. Farley. That might be fair to some other defendants who are all over the discovery, but Mr. Farley, he's only in like seven out of the 191 overt acts and he's only in four of the counts. So in that six to nine months, my actual engagement in his advocacy will be a matter of days. It's something we can do in a week, a week and a half. But what the state has done to rob him of his rights under the Sixth Amendment and his rights to due process and his right to be treated equally and not be discriminated against based on wealth or anything else, they've put 28 people together. And then for those people that are in such a small part of the discovery, they've created a situation where you don't get to pick your attorney. You just get to hope that you'll have someone agree to something, even though it might not make sense. And now look what we have. We have people who are still unable to hire an attorney. And I think part of it is because of this lack of severance. And so judge to, to force Mr. Farley to sit there with a paid advocate 
who's not going to do anything for months at a time is not fair, Your Honor. They're essentially picking his attorney for him by saying, oh, you got to have this amount of money or otherwise you can't defend yourself, which is not fair because what he only needs is someone to defend him for a few weeks. And this, this RICO count, they could easily just prove just those overt acts and the existence of a conspiracy. It's not going to take a long time. They're going to say, oh, they're going to make us redo this RICO conspiracy over and over and over. No, they just got to show what they say is a, a seemingly based on the rulings of my other motions. It's not in that hard. A nexus, a few overt acts, a pattern, and that's it. That can be done with this handful of witnesses in addition to his other counts, Judge, but that should be separate. That way it can be done in like a week, week and a half, and that way Mr. Farley isn't forced to defend himself in the way that he has to resort to because of money and because of this sort of wealth discrimination of accusing this many people at once of something, Your Honor. And so I, I included other arguments, of course, but those have been articulated by other co-defendants in the past. It's more just for the record. But I do cite some things like Morris v. State, whenever it appears necessary to determine a fair determination of the guilt or innocence of a defendant, to have a fair determination of that, Your Honor, Mr. Farley should have his trial severed so that it can be just a week, week and a half, and then he can have an attorney of his choosing, free of conflict, and he can have his due process and his confrontation under the Fifth and the Sixth Amendments. Okay, let's move on to now the uh, your, your argument in terms of the... Uh gang statute, un um, unconstitutionality, as well as the RICO statute. Yes, sir. Which, which one do you want, Your Honor, to concentrate? Um, I'm doing RICO. Uh, Ms. Rosenwasser is doing gang. Okay. Uh, let's see then. I will table Ms. Rosenwasser's one till tomorrow. Uh, that's She's doing the gang statute? Madam? Yes, Your Honor. Is that what you're doing? Okay, all right. I'm sorry to interrupt. That's okay. No, 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 that's fine, sir. Okay. Um, then you're doing unconstitutional to RICO. Yes, sir. All right, handle that for me, please. Oh. Let's do that tonight. Yes, Judge. Um, you know, things don't change until they get challenged. Our country has a long history of case law that then realizes, oh, this was wrong, and it just takes someone doing the right thing and challenging that for that determination to even go up to a higher court, Your Honor. So that's why I am objecting to these. Um, Your Honor, just because something has been deemed constitutional in the past just doesn't mean that it is. And I think What's this case basis? specifically. What's your basis to have yeah. to, for the for me as a trial judge in this case yeah. to have it declared or the, the, the unconstitutional? It hasn't our Supreme Court uh, already passed on this issue? Not as it pertains to this exact set of facts. That's why this is distinguishable, Judge. One. The, the scope of it and the financial aspect, but also the First Amendment aspect. We have several overt acts here that involve artistry, just entrepreneurship, clothing, and that's an unconstitutional application of finding someone accountable criminally for something. You know, we... Well, I think you know, the we'll state's argument that. is um, when that... When that, when those acts, and this is what I guess we'll find out at trial, right. whether or not those acts are basically admissions. So exactly, Your Honor. So you know that that's something we'll you know take up at trial. Yes, Judge. And I just, I, I of course I don't expect the court to rule in my favor on this, but I do want to have it for the record. And you never know, this is a chance to do something cool, and I think it is the right thing, Your Honor. Um, the vagueness as well of the RICO statute. Well, you have to have a good faith basis to challenge the statute. So I think you yeah. raised. I think you've raised one. If you're saying that that is, that is the issue of the of the interplay between the yeah. First Amendment and clothing, and some other things. Yes, that yeah. that is fine. Yeah. And you certainly are well within your rights, and and you wouldn't be a good advocate if you weren't doing that on behalf of your client. Okay. Yes, Judge. And just real quick for the record, the other things I put in my motion where the fact that they're able to put so much evidence in the indictment itself is unconstitutional. We don't get to do that for any other allegation. There's social media pictures. In the indictment, Your Honor is going to read the indictment to the jury, and they're going to see actual evidence before they even get to the opening statements. That's not um, how it's supposed to work, Your Honor. So I'm going to um, read it. Well, actually, I'm going to tape it. So, um, and I don't plan on showing the picture. So, yes, Judge. And then, lastly, we don't have any mechanism here, like we do in civil law, to have a motion for summary judgment, which is a type of thing I think would have been granted for Mr. Farley here, because 
not only is the indictment doesn't allege anything, the discovery itself and the warrant affidavit itself for his arrest simply alleges presence and association. So there's nothing stopping the, the, the state when they're out to get somebody, they can just in bad faith with a warrant that doesn't say anything about how you're a party, just loop you into a big RICO case and then start pressuring you to cooperate or take some kind of deal because what else are you going to do? But there is no mechanism pre-trial to have your honor look at any of that. And so that's oh, another aspect. Suppress. Well, I can't suppress the whole case, Judge. I can always suppress know, but, some but As it. it pertains to your client, you filed you filed some 23 motions. You're, I think you're doing a fine job. Well, thank you, Judge. Okay. Anything else? Uh, Relates to the unconstitutional. No, Your Honor, that's all. Okay, all right. Thank you, sir. All right, Mr. Floyd. Thank you, Your I think Honor. he's got uh, you know, a motion to sever the counts, sever the trial, and unconstitutionality of the RICO statute. Yes, and Your I'll Honor. Table the, I'll let Ms. Rosenwasser tomorrow cover the duplicative count issue as well as the uh, uh, gang statute. And I'll, I think she said Mr. Carlson will come in and argue the evidence 418 issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Ms. Johnson. That's fine. Okay. All right. And Mr. F uh, Mr. Floyd. Um, yes, sir. Whatever you, whatever the ruling is, which can I ask you to prepare an order um, on on whatever grounds uh, on the on the on on the issues that I've denied you prepare the suitable one order? through six the amended special general. Yes, sir. All right. I'll do. Let me rule on these things first, and then I'll let you. I may, um, I'll, depending how I rule on these, I'll, I, I may ask you to include these. Okay. Whatever the court's pleasure. Is, okay. Yes. All right, sir. Um, so severance. Um, it, your Honor has already heard severance motions. I believe seven of them. I have. You have already denied them all. Yes. Um, I had a feeling you'd remember, but just in case, I wanted to remind you. Um, <laughs> The, the mistaken premise, and it's been true throughout them all and is true here, is the idea that somehow if you sever, the trial becomes much smaller, shorter, easier, a week or whatever. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. This is a conspiracy case. We're going to have to prove the enterprise. We're going to have to prove the overt acts. And the evidence is largely the same. I can't say it's exactly the same. I won't go that far but it will be substantially the same in each circumstance. And so there's not that time efficiency that keeps getting rolled out in front of you simply doesn't exist. That's the primary reason why, and we've cited these cases previously, I, I haven't been able to find a reported Georgia RICO case where severance was granted and the issue came up on appeal. I just haven't seen it. Um, every one of them, the, the posture is Severance has been denied. The court looks at it, says, the appellate court looks at it, says it's a matter of discretion, and discretion was appropriately exercised. And those cases are very similar to this one. Uh, we've also cited to you on the same principle uh, an extensive number of federal RICO, consp RICO conspiracy cases. I'm dealing specifically with RICO conspiracy um, because the question is the same and the standard is essentially the same. Uh, it wouldn't, it, the problem of, the problems that we've mentioned in the past, inefficiency, the trauma of causing individuals to testify repeatedly to violent acts they've suffered, the opportunities for witnesses to shape their testimony in subsequent trials, all of those considerations, that's not the entire list, but we've briefed it extensively in the past. Um, they don't go away. They would actually only get worse if Mr. Farley was to have two trials, one on RICO and one on murder, uh, et cetera. It doesn't, that doesn't solve the problem. It really magnifies it. Um, I think part of Mr. Farley's constitutional arguments drifted over into the severance side, uh, or perhaps he feels they're applicable to both. It, it, it doesn't make any difference here because he was talking about Sixth Amendment issues. Um, Mr. Farley has an attorney, and that's Mr. Mineta's. Mr. Mineta's has, as you've pointed out, filed a very extensive list of motions on his behalf and is fighting for him as hard as he possibly can, as we would all expect him to do. So, but 
part of what comes with that is Mr. Farley doesn't have standing to raise constitutional issues relating to other people who don't have counsel for whatever reason. He can raise his own. He could raise it if he didn't have counsel, couldn't obtain it. But that's not the situation. And therefore, that's just not an argument that's available to him. Uh, as far as constitutionality is concerned, let me first address vagueness. There are quite literally hundreds of RICO challenges based on vagueness. None have succeeded. Uh, there are hundreds in the federal system. There's uh, approximately a half dozen, I believe, in our system. And the counterpart state RICO statutes across the country, there's about another 35 or 36 of them. Many of those have been challenged. Vagueness has not worked once. Vagueness didn't work on in the Rodriguez case against our gang statute either for essentially the same reasons because the statutes have a lot of similarities. Um, there's nothing new here presented on vagueness that hasn't been addressed in the past. In fact, there's nothing really specific at all presented on vagueness. As to First Amendment, um, it, it really, it, it just conflates the problem. The, the argument that keeps, or the statement that keeps getting presented to the court is that speech has been criminalized. That's not what, that's not what we're talking about. Um, we are talking about speech as evidence. There's no offense that says somebody's not being charged with making an offensive lyric or video. That crime doesn't exist in Georgia. It is not alleged in this indictment. But the fact that somebody is engaged in some sort of performance um, doesn't immunize them and doesn't create a First Amendment shield against all responsibility. I've not been able to find a case that said that, that um, a charge is unconstitutional or a statute is unconstitutional um, because uh, uh, some sort of performance is involved. And frankly, that wouldn't be a basis to hold the statute unconstitutional. It would be a basis to exclude a specific piece of evidence. I just imagine that's an argument we're going to get to pretty soon, but that's not a constitutional argument here. Um, the United States Supreme Court in Wisconsin versus Mitchell made it absolutely clear that something doesn't stop being evidence because it's in a book or a movie or a poem or a song or a diary. Um, because that would lead us to the absurd circumstance in which a person who simply picked up the phone and called the police and said, I murdered John Smith. I did it in this place, I did it on this day, I did it for this reason, and I did it using this weapon. You can go find his body right now. Well, we pretty much know what's going to happen there. Right? But if I post it on YouTube and I sing it, that becomes inadmissible. And if we use it to charge, the statute becomes unconstitutional. There's nothing, absolutely nothing that supports that. Um, the too much evidence in the indictment um, this is exactly what I was alluding to before, which is the argument that the sort of Goldilocks argument the state usually faces. It's either too much or it's too little. <laughs> it's never just right. Um, but, you know, this is the same defendant who 30 minutes ago was arguing that we hadn't given the dictionary definition of various phrases in it and now says, but wait, this statute's unconstitutional because you can talk about too much. Those two things can't occupy the same place at the same time. Um, as I said, I, I, I am not aware of any case anywhere in the country holding any RICO statute unconstitutional on any of these grounds. Don't think this should be the first one. Okay. All right. Um, as it pertains to the um, amended motion to sever counts, I'm going to deny that motion. As it relates to Mr. Farley, Mr. Farley, I'm also going to deny the motion to sever uh, his trial from the other other co-defendants, and I'm also going to deny the motion to declare the Georgia RICO statute unconstitutional. Um, so, Mr. Uh, Manettis, we will take up the re the three things I think we'll take up tomorrow uh, as it relates to Mr. Farley's duplicative counts and the unconstitutionality of uh, the 418 and the um, 
and the gang statute tomorrow. So I'll take up those. I've otherwise, um, the other issues, as I've indicated, we'll, ta we'll table those until such time as like for the autopsy photographs and the um, music video and social media evidence, okay? Yes, Judge. Um, and the evidentiary motions are You've got three, yeah, we will take up those on the 28th. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Your Honor. We our witnesses would be available on the twenty eighth. So yeah, th but those are only the three uh, for those three motions, right? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All right. So we'll take up those then. All right. Um, in the waning hours of uh, the day, let me just recap, Miss um, Rosenwasser, for tomorrow. You've got um, Walter Panea. Yes, Your Honor. He'll be coming first. You got Quentin Hall. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Do you have anybody else? Uh, anybody else that potentially? You might be able to move up or it might be uh, depending upon how, how we go tomorrow. Um, not to my knowledge, I'll reach out to Investigator Worrell tonight. He was one of the people on for Wednesday. I can see if he's available. He, um, but we do have Mr. Stillwell's motion to dismiss. Uh, we, have our, uh, we should be able to do that. I know the court wished to hear that tomorrow as well. Okay, all right. And then obviously I'll be ready for Mr. Farley's motions also. The two that we just talked about. The All right, I think that that's plenty. And then there'll be some, I'm sure that, um, folks, just to put you on notice, Thursday, we will have to take up the um, issues involving the jury questionnaire. So what I'd like you to do is prepare for the, uh, we, have, we have a list of the questions that we propose to ask. What I'm asking you all to do is if you have a specific objection to a question that the court is going to Put in the questionnaire you come prepared to argue those on thursday morning i'm not going to go through all of them um, unless i absolutely have to in that respect but um you've had plenty of time at this point in time to kind of consider that so thursday morning we'll uh we'll take up that issue uh is there anything else i need to kind of uh, as an administrative announcement i need to do mr floyd you'll take care of a suitable order I, send that to mr Manettis. i will do that and your honor i just want to ask one question because format the, there were six amended special and general demurros, and they were filed each as a separate document, as you saw. It, would the court prefer a separate order as to each one, or is it okay to consolidate? It's okay to consolidate that, yes, sir. All right, thank you. All right. Yes, Mr. Adams. Um, um, perhaps I've missed it. Have, have we, has the court sent out a, a proposed um, list of jury, que jury questions? I know we've submitted some, some other attorneys have submitted them, the state has submitted them. Is, is there a court's uh, what I'll do is I will ask, uh, Mr. Mr. Kearns is not feeling well, so I'm going to ask him tomorrow if that hasn't been sent out already, it should be sent out. Okay. All right. Um, yep. If you have an otherwise, if you submitted questions then that's fine, but, um, Yes, I'll ask Mr. Kearns about that tomorrow, and um, we'll hopefully get it out tomorrow sometime. He, I think he's been working on it. I've seen some of it, so we should be good in that respect, okay? All right. Anything else in terms of administrative uh, announcements? No, you're on. All right, well, then we'll see you all tomorrow morning for an uh, anticipated start time about 930, okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, all right. We're in recess. Um. Oh, I'll, I'll get with you.